come to order. <laughs> and the uh, first order of business will be uh, two uh, rules before we get into the, uh, the budget hearing itself. Uh, the first um, rule will be on the uh, line item veto. And I think you all know that uh, negotiations have, uh, have broken down on the, the, the line item veto. The, uh, the Senate has passed a version, in my opinion, which uh, totally waters down and makes the, the line item veto provision uh, inoperative. Uh, it means that the president would have to uh, act on each individual item. Uh, the time constraints involved would be uh, just uh, completely inoperative. And it would be uh, my hope, uh, along with, I think, Porter Goss, who I will yield to in a minute, uh, that we would uh, not go to conference with the uh, Senate on the light out of veto, because anything that we would get out of there would be so watered down, it would be useless, and it would probably prohibit us from uh, ever enacting uh, this year a real line item veto. And I would rather see it die and start all over again. Uh, Mr. Goss, uh, I'll yield to you for any statements you might have on that. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am uh, a little more than puzzled about why we were not able to get from the minority the um, unanimous consent request. All I can see that's going to happen is we're going to have to spend two hours uh, tomorrow on a rule uh, in order to discuss this, a matter that's already been much discussed, and it's time that we had uh, wanted to set aside and use for the budget. And it seems to me that that is a subject of uh, much more on people's minds these days and certainly uh, overwhelming interest in it. Uh, and I am uh, very concerned that we are in a dilatory tactic here. Uh, also, I, if I remember the minority, I'm not quite sure how I could justify at this point uh, being on the side of, uh, of, of allowing a unanimous consent request to go forward with what has been a very strong House position on the line item veto, especially in, in the face of the fact that we've got a sunset problem with the Senate version. We've got uh, this whole question about separate enrollment, this definition of what an item is. Uh, there are many uh, unexplored areas, and I agree with you. I think they're so unexplored as that they may be uh, a fatal flaw. And so to not be able to, at this point, to uh, insist to go forward with a House version appears to me be pretty much indefensible. And if there is an explanation, I look forward to hearing it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, <clears throat> the gentleman, you've heard the uh, the reason why we uh, we're here. I don't uh, I don't know that we can preclude the possibility of a unanimous consent uh, request on the floor, which would negate uh, a debate on this particular rule, and perhaps it might not come up. We'll just have to uh, see what happens uh, tomorrow uh, before we begin debate on the uh, on the uh, very important budget. Mr. Chairman, if you'll yield further, if, if, if nevertheless we're now having to take time that we were planning to do for the budget even here in this committee because we've not been able to work this out, and uh, I hope we are able to get the unanimous consent and get to the other business of the House. But uh, I think it is, it is more than puzzling that we're confronted with this situation. No. The gentleman, gentleman's points are well taken. Mr. Mopley. I would hope that uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Goss, is indicating that anybody on this side of the aisle is trying to hold this up at this time. We're ready no. to to uh, vote unanimous consent. Thank you. That's and if I might add, uh, these uh, two uh, rules were put on the calendar of our hearing at an, uh, just this morning, and uh, Mr. Moakley was gracious enough to, uh, to agree to have them come up uh, without any uh, delay. And I appreciate that very much coming from the minority uh, ranking member. Mr. Chairman, just Ms. very briefly. Mr. Bielenson. I think we over here don't know, don't know why unanimous consent was not granted. I don't think it was meant to be dilatory. It does slow things up by a day, not an awful lot. It does take some time out of our, our time on the floor tomorrow, I guess, which is a shame. But as we suggested, perhaps, perhaps unanimous consent can yet be achieved. I just want to say that I quite, most of us, I think, quite agree with, with the comments of the chair about the unworkability of the type of line item veto that the Senate came up with. Not that some of us don't prefer a different form of it anyway, you know, the Stenholm form rather than the one that, that got out of the House. But hopefully they'll. You know, in conference, they'll come up with something which is workable and usable, and which we can pass sometime later this year. I think the likelihood is good that some kind of sensible line item veto will become law this year. And if it takes a couple of extra hours, it's a shame, but it'll happen. Why are we going to conference? You've heard. Uh... It's nice to see him smiling, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> well, after those assurances, Mr. Chairman, I think the problem is very nearly solved. Well, That's very all. good. Well, well, we'll we'll find out, won't we? If there is no further discussion on uh, on this rule, uh, the uh, hearing is uh, concluded on on this rule, and uh, we will take up the uh, the second matter. The uh
The second matter is the uh, uh, government, no, not yet, I don't want to do it yet. The government uh, reform and oversight uh, uh, committee uh, had before us the Regulatory Transition Act. This is a similar situation, and uh, what we are doing is simply uh, sending the House bill back over to the Senate, the same as we're doing with the uh, uh, with this bill. Is there any uh, any further discussion on this uh, on this rule? If not, the uh, hearing is concluded on this one, and uh, the chair will be in receipt of a motion on the first uh, uh, rule dealing with the line item veto. Mr. Quillen. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant a rule for consideration in the House. Any rule of the House to the contrary notwithstanding of a motion to take from the Speaker's table, S4, the Senate passed line item veto bill and to strike all after the enacting clause and insert the text of H.R. 2 as passed by the House. The rule provides for one hour of debate equally divided between the committees on government reform and oversight and rules. Finally, the rule provides for one motion to recommit. You've heard the uh, motion by the gentleman from Tennessee. Is there any discussion or amendment to the uh, motion? If not, all those in favor of reporting the resolution will say aye. Aye. All those opposed will say nay. Let the record show there are no nay votes. The resolution is reported unanimously. And uh, Mr. Goss will carry for the majority. Mr. Hall will carry for the minority. And Mr. Hall for the minority. Uh, the chair will be, in addition, uh, will be in receipt to an additional uh, motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant a rule for the consideration in the House. Any rule of the House to the contrary notwithstanding of a motion to take from the Speaker's table, S-219, track all after the enacting clause of the Senate bill, and insert the text of H.R. 450 as passed by the House. The rule provides for one hour of, of debate equally divided between the committees on government reform, <coughs> oversight, and judiciary. Finally, the rule provides for one motion to commit. You've heard the uh, motion by the gentleman from Tennessee. Is there any discussion or amendment to the motion? If not, all those in favor will say aye. 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 All those opposed will say nay. And uh, there are, let the record show there are no nay votes, and the uh, motion is, uh, the resolution is reported unanimously. And Mr. Dreyer will carry for the majority. And for the minority? Mr. Hall from Ohio. Mr. Hall from Ohio. The... Uh, Okay. The um, next order of business is the uh, hearing on the uh, 1996 budget resolution for fiscal year 1996. Uh, before hearing from our uh, first panel of witnesses, let me make some uh, opening remarks on what I would call this very historic nature of this bill following uh, which I will yield to the ranking minority member for any opening statement that he might have or other members of, the, uh, of this body. Ladies and gentlemen, the, uh, today is truly a historic day and one I personally have waited for for a very, very long time. Today, this committee will consider HCON Resolution uh, 67 uh, and vision, it, this truly, in my opinion, is a visionary blueprint which guarantees a balanced federal budget. This is a remarkable feat given our nation's track record of only having balanced the budget of this country 28% of the time since 1901. That's almost 100 years ago. But Republicans took charge of this Congress in January, and they did so on a crusade to balance the budget. And today we are presented with the victory of this crusade. We promised a balanced budget, and this resolution really does uphold that promise. Furthermore, this is also the first time that Congress will actually debate, and this is such a key point, how to balance the budget and not whether or not we're going to balance the budget. That's the key. All of the resolutions before us on this floor during the next two days will be in the form of a balanced budget, whether you are of a liberal persuasion, a uh, a uh, conservative persuasion, all of the budgets will be in balance that will be offered on the floor. This is a victory in 
be offered on the floor. This is a victory in and of itself, no matter whether it's done in five years or six years or seven years, we will pass that balanced budget. And the lion's share, and I wish uh, Chairman Kasich were here, the lion's share, share of uh, the credit for this historic moment rests on the shoulders of the Budget Committee under the leadership of John Kasich. They have produced a comprehensive and descriptive blueprint of how government can be, be responsible in reconstructing and delivering needed government services at a price that we can afford. Two years ago, a balanced budget resolution received just 22 votes on the floor of Congress. Last year, only 74 votes. And this year, it will receive a majority of votes in this House. And ladies and gentlemen, we've come a long, long way. Despite this historic nature of this debating, something very important is missing, however. The President, despite numerous attempts by the Speaker, by Chairman Kasich, by myself, in a letter to, to he and, uh, and to his Chief of Staff, uh, Leon Panetta, and others, the Clinton administration still has not submitted a budget to Congress even close to being balanced. And I would like to ask unanimous consent uh, to submit the letter that I wrote to the President and to uh, his spokesman, the Chief of Staff, Leon uh, Panetta, without objection. With the exception of the President's budget, from the beginning we have stated that all other alternative budgets must bring us to a balanced budget by or before the year 2002 in order to be eligible for consideration but we have heard nothing from the President. We have heard nothing from the minority leader, Mr. Gephardt. The truth is that the President has no plan to balance the budget. He has no plan to pay down the debt. And he has no plan to fundamentally restructure the federal government, which is the only way you can really come to a balanced budget, not just tinker around the edges. He has made himself completely irrelevant in this debate. And that's too bad, really. Today, we have a real balanced budget resolution before us. And after tough decisions uh, are down the, lying down the road, it's going to be very, very difficult. I know that my colleagues remember, as I do, and uh, I see the uh, former uh, budget uh, chairman uh, in the audience here, who will be recognized very shortly. But I can remember the sad realities of, which of what occurred after passage of the landmark Graham Rudman legislation back in 1985, which would have balanced the books by 1991. And I can recall having voted for that, having sent out press releases, saying we were going to balance the budget. We were going to bring it under control by 1991. Well, we met the budget targets for the, the first two years, in 86 and 87. But then a new Congress took office in 1987. And even without a recession, without a recession, when we had more revenues than ever coming into the federal coffers, this Congress found it too difficult to make the necessary spending cuts to continue meeting those targets. The balanced budget goal was extended and extended and later abandoned entirely. And members, this cannot happen again. To prevent a reoccurrence of this, I believe that Congress must get at the roots of federal spending in the first two years, dramatically restructuring government right away, not in the years six and seven, thereby ensuring steady downward sloping deficits to a budget surplus at the end of seven years. Two years or four years or six years, we do not know where we will be, just like we didn't know in 1985 about setting the agenda. And whoever or whatever that may be, whoever is going to be here, two years from now and four years from now and even six years from now, by the time this budget finally gets balanced, I strongly believe that our commitment to a balanced budget by a date certain must not waver. In order to get at these roots, I believe that this Congress must concentrate on the reconciliation and the appropriation bills over the next few months where the real spending cuts and program restructuring will occur. That's where it's going to take guts, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we will hear testimony from a number of members supporting various approaches to eliminating our deficit. And let me state from the outset that I believe that the resolution before us does represent an honest approach to balancing the budget. And I intend to support it. Even though I personally prefer a five-year balanced budget plan, 
and intend to vote for the Newman-Solomon proposal that uh, will be offered here in a few minutes. However, if that fails, I, and I'm sure all of the other members of the task force on balanced budgets, uh, intend to wholeheartedly support and vote for, and I hope all of our colleagues will, will do that as well, the very good work of my friend John Kasich and the other members of the Budget Committee. They've done an outstanding job. This places us, I think, on the right road and sets us on a glide path to finally, once and for all, balancing the budget. And my own desire to balance the budget as soon as possible, I think, can be fulfilled during the reconciliation and appropriation processes as these, this member and others intend to make sure that the Congress stringently abides by these spending restrictions. I intend to work very closely with the Budget Committee to make sure that when it is time to cut the bureaucratic fat, and that time will be here very shortly, within the next six weeks, that Congress will be there at the table with all its silverware ready to go to work. And with that, I would yield to my very good friend, uh, the ranking minority member, Mr. Joseph Moakley of Boston, Massachusetts. Well, I'm glad you Joseph. said we're going to be there with silverware. I was anticipating plastic spoons and something from the Dairy Queen. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. This may come as a surprise to many of you, but I'm very much opposed to this budget proposal. This budget robs senior citizens in order to give the very richest Americans a big fat tax break, and I don't believe that that's what the American people really want. Quite frankly, I think it's wrong to cut Medicare in order to pay for this ill-time and ill-advised foolishness. But then I didn't sign your contract with America, or as I call it, head start with, for the rich. And I'm glad I didn't, because no matter what promises were made, no matter what budget gobbledygook you may use, no matter how you phrase it and no matter how you spin it, this budget will raise out-of-pocket expenses for senior citizens by over $1,000 by the year of 2002 in order to give the richest 1% of Americans a $20,000 tax break. I think that's outrageous. America's senior citizens raised our families, worked in our factories, fought our wars. They made this country what it is today, and now they're being called upon to pay the costs of a Republican campaign promise to the very rich. I know my Republican friends signed the contract on America, but let me ask them, did all the Medicare recipients in your districts, do they sign this contract too? And let me say that to every single senior citizen watching this hearing, you'd better call your representative as quickly as possible because we're talking about a Republican bill that will not only raise your health care costs by about $1,000 a year, but also cut Social Security benefits by about $24 billion between the years 1999 and 2002. Fit this budget will not only hurt, this budget will cripple. And if stealing from senior citizens weren't bad enough, this budget also adds an average of $5,000 to the cost of going to college. Why in the world are we making it more difficult for future generations to get a decent education? We need a well-educated population if we're going to compete effectively in the global market. John. And these Medicare cuts and student loan cuts are going to have a very bad effect in the entire country and probably much more in my city of Boston because of the famous health care facilities, the teaching hospitals, universities. They're going to suffer tremendously if this Republican budget goes through. And let me tell you, we can all talk about the need to control health care costs until we're blue in the face. But finding medical breakthroughs and establishing ways to shorten hospital stays through medical advances are one sure way to lower these hospital costs. This budget makes that more unlikely. I have my great respect for my colleague from Ohio. I've known him for many years. But I must tell him that in all my years in the Congress, I've never seen a bill that would so adversely affect so many people. 
I know that's not the gentleman's intention, but as we look at it, uh, uh, that seems to be the reality. It's obvious that we have a different vision of government and a different view of government's responsibilities. But my heart, I believe that this budget is wrong. The wrong people get rewarded and the wrong people get hurt. So I urge my colleagues in the interest of defending seniors and students, oppose this Republican budget and give up the idea of this tax break for the very rich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there is a vote on the uh, floor. Uh, there are about five minutes left in the vote. Uh, we're going to recess and we'll be back two minutes after the, uh, the vote is concluded on the floor. Stand in recess. This, uh, this meeting will come uh, back to order. I know that uh, the distinguished chairman of the, um, uh, the budget committee is has got to go back to a meeting that's currently going on and so we're we're going to before we have any further opening statements uh, we're going to recognize the uh, the chairman of the budget committee and uh, uh, John we want to welcome you before the committee I want to just tell you that um, of all the people in this Congress uh, you are one that I just admire and respect uh, the one of the most because of, of your uh, the diligence and the way you go about things you uh, you're a man that gets things done and uh, us former Marines like that uh, I just want to say something about uh, about your budget that I said before you uh, came to testify and uh, I won't I'll just mention two little paragraphs and uh, the uh, but uh, uh, John, you know, I mentioned that this isn't a historic occasion, and uh, in my remarks, I talked about this being a victory in of itself. Uh, no matter whether uh, we balance the budget in five, six, or seven years, that the question today is not on whether we balance the budget. The question is on how we do it and what a long way we have come. And I said, quote, that the lion's share of credit for this historic moment rests on the shoulders of your budget committee under the leadership of John Kasich, uh, that you have produced a comprehensive and descriptive blueprint of how government can be responsibly reconstructed to deliver needed government services at a price we can afford. And uh, John, you've done that. And uh, as you know, I prefer to see it done in five years, but uh, basically the same way that you do it. And uh, I'm certainly going to do everything I can to make sure that, uh, first of all, if we can't do it in five years, six years, certainly we do it. And your budget is the blueprint to do it with. And I intend to support it and get you all the votes that I can uh, if, uh, if we can't pass one that would go sooner. So having said that, I want to again commend you for the great work you and your committee have done. Uh, you look a little thinner and a little more harassed uh, than uh, I've known you in the past. Uh, but hang in there. We've only got two days to go. Mr. Casey. Mr. Chairman, I, my deepest concern as I begin to uh, testify is I caught the very end of Mr. Moakley's comments, and I'm, I'm still going to get those Celtics tickets, aren't I? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Okay, okay. I mean, need some, I mean, need some Red Sox tickets, too, before it's over. You don't mind if they laugh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't beat that one. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's uh, good to be here, and um, I, I think you made a uh, very important point, and that is that uh, the debate has now changed, uh, not as to whether we ought to have a balanced budget, but uh, the way in which we get to a balanced budget. I mean, it's real simple to me. If um, and I respect the people who are, who are critical of the budget and they're looking at line item over line item and uh, they're, they're saying, what about this group and what about that group? Frankly, when you take a look, for example, at entitlement spending, it will still go up uh, significant levels of uh, increase in entitlements. I don't have all the numbers in front of me here, but if you take, for example, in the area of Medicare, we go from approximately 200, uh, 850 billion 
to about $1.6 trillion in entitlement spending. That is, uh, that is hardly a, uh, a reduction in spending. In fact, uh, let's see if I can look at these uh, transparencies. Let, let me give you about total spending, for example. We will go in total spending from $9.4 trillion over the last seven years. And let me put that in perspective. If you started a business when Christ was on earth, if you lost a million dollars a day, seven days a week, you would have to lose a million dollars a day, seven days a week for the next 700 years to get to one trillion. And we spent in the last seven years $9.4 trillion. If we did nothing, we would be spending $13.3 trillion. And under our plan uh, to get to zero, a balanced budget, we will, we will go from $9.4 trillion to $11.8 trillion uh, over the next seven years. Uh, this is a significant increase in spending, although, as we all know, programs, uh, some of the entitlement programs uh, grow uh, significantly. And if you take a look, for example, at Medicare, then you see, for example, under the last seven years, Medicare grew. Medicare was spent $844 billion. Under our plan, we will go from $844 billion to $1.5 trillion instead of $1.8 trillion. Uh, these are approximate numbers. If we continued growing at $1.8 trillion, of course, as people are beginning to realize, Medicare goes bankrupt. And when we take a look at Medicare, for example, we look at the private sector where many businesses found themselves in the same circumstances as the federal government, on the road to bankruptcy, and they needed to do some things. And what they did was they looked at, uh, at innovating health care, and they ended up with a system that saved themselves from bankruptcy, and also a system that... Um, uh, that allowed them to have very high customer satisfaction. And that is precisely what we're doing in this area. Same is true in Medicaid. The same is true in civil service and military retirement programs. They all continue to grow. Now, there will be some real cuts in the area of discretionary spending. Frankly, a lot of the programs that we have in discretionary spending are duplicative. Uh, we think they can be uh, bundled together and managed far better. And all this is designed to say one single thing, that if we continue to do precisely what we have been doing over the last 20 or 30 years, and if we continue to maintain the same economics, it's really simple what's going to happen. The children of this country will find themselves in a no-growth economy, and in fact, uh, the children of this country will not have the same opportunities that that my generation had. I mean, the greatest American legacy is that, is that the children will, will be able to fly, as I like to say. I mean, literally fly. That, you know, you can sprout wings and you can, you can dream dreams and you can do anything you want to do. And in a no-growth economy, you can't fly. In fact, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And uh, I believe this resolution is one that uh, goes across the board. I, uh, and and as, as uh, Congressman Moakley pointed out, the former chairman pointed out, it's something that affects just about everybody. Uh, there's a comment this morning in the newspapers about, uh, about corporate loopholes. And, you know, is lo are loopholes off the table? Well, it's like Mark Twain's death. It's uh, reported demise is greatly exaggerated. Uh, we've gone across the board and we've impacted on virtually everything and we've done it in a very careful way. The amazing thing is that even under this proposal, federal spending will continue to increase. And if we went back and did town meetings with people, their first question would be, why are you increasing spending? Why are you going from nine to eleven trillion dollars? I mean, why is it growing so quickly? Well, it's because we want to have a rational plan in order to balance the budget. A word about the tax cuts. First of all, if there is any institution that ought to be emphasized into the 21st century, it's the American family. So many of the problems that we have in America today stem from the fact that the family is, is in some cases, has deteriorated. 
The $500 tax credit, I want to tell you, I was at the Red Lobster on Sunday and there was a guy and his wife and four kids that came in and I was sitting behind them and the guy turned around and he looked at me and he said, thanks for what you're doing for my family. He says, I won't pay any income taxes next year because of your tax credit. Made me feel pretty darn good that there are families in this country that are going to be helped. And in terms of this business about the rich and the poor, 74% of the benefits go to people below $75,000. And for those that want to talk about capital gains, first of all, I'm going to argue with, with people that the capital gains uh, uh, reductions, the incentives, which are designed to to widen the stem on the funnel so that when we pour prosperity into this economy, the Fed doesn't have to turn around and raise interest rates. As soon as things start cooking, up go the rates. Well, with, a, with a, a much deeper infrastructure, private sector infrastructure, we can have more economic growth. And the capital gains incentives, you know what that's all about? That's all about jobs and opportunity. And where I came from, we didn't hate rich people. The only people that didn't like rich people were guilty rich people. And where I came from, we believed that if people created jobs, we could get a job, and then if they were president of the company, we could work hard enough, go to school, graduate, and then own their company someday. I mean, that's kind of the philosophy we had in Blue Collar McKee's Rocks. I don't believe that the capital gains uh, incentives will cost this Treasury money. We pay for them under this bill. We pay for them under this bill. But I don't believe over time it will cost us money. But capital gains incentives are necessary because that is what will give people incentives to risk take and create jobs in America. I think the tax component is very important. And for those that said we couldn't balance the budget and pay for our tax cuts, of course, we've proven them all wrong with this uh, resolution. And um, in addition, and really almost to close here, we're not only about saving the next generation, but Joe, I would tell you it's about a pendulum. For the last 30 or 40 years, we have sent an awful lot of power, money, and control to the federal government because there were things that needed to be done. Civil rights. I mean, you know, the pictures that I've watched on TV of the beatings that, that, that blacks in America took were just beyond description to me. Every time I saw John, John Lewis's picture, I'd turn off the set. I figured I'd save him a beating. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, you look at that, and we did civil rights because we had to. Education, big gaps between states. Uh, the issue of, uh, of health care. We needed to do some things. But frankly, life's about pendulums, and the pendulum is, is up here too far. And Americans are feeling like, hey, you know, I live in Columbus or Westerville, Ohio, and I live in Boston, and frankly, if I could have more of my power and money and control back, I can do a better job of fixing things than they can in Washington. And it's not more than a pendulum. It's time the pendulum come back, and it'll come back here, and it'll be here for a while, and then you know what, maybe it'll move a little bit back to where the federal government will assume some things. This budget does not propose an elimination of the federal government. It proposes a, a better focusing, a better targeting, and it, and it really responds to what I believe the American people have wanted, and that is more of their money, and more control, and more power to address things where they live. The greatest thing about all this, though, is simply this. When we pass this resolution, and I do believe it will pass, and when we go to reconciliation and we lock in the enforcement mechanisms, which, of course, we will do, um, we will guarantee what Alan Greenspan said. Alan Greenspan gave the greatest testimony I've heard in my career. He said, if in fact we can balance the budget by 2002, we can unleash a prosperity in this country that we cannot chart because the American system is so wonderful, the people are so creative, there's no telling what we can do in this country if set free. And this is all about the future. This is all about the 21st century. This is all about what goes on within the boundaries of the United States in terms of what we can create. But frankly, it's also about the world and what America's leadership in the world is. And I believe that um, by giving up a little bit now and setting some priorities, we in fact can have a tremendous prosperity. And the 21st century truly will be the age of responsibility and the age of, of individual achievement. And that's what we're all about to do as a, as a result of this budget. So, Mr. Chairman, it's a pleasure for me to be here.
the revolution is occurring. It's no longer about do we do it, it's a matter of oh, how. Yeah. And that in and of itself is revolutionary. <clears throat> well, Mr. Chairman, I can't think of a better way for you to, to end your testimony because that really is the truth. This is a revolution. And it is a revolution that is coming non too soon. You know, John, you mentioned uh, talking to uh, the family of four at the uh, Red Lobster the other day. Uh, and I was in a similar situation talking to a young couple. I think they were probably 27, 28 years old. And they already had three children, as I did at that age. And, uh, you know, they, they said, you know, what does the, the debt mean to us? We, we don't really understand it. And when you talk to them that uh, we have a debt today, an accumulated debt of, of five trillion dollars, and that over the, uh, over the next five years, according to the, uh, to the president's uh, proposal, if you look at this line here, President Clinton's budget, it accumulates almost $200 billion every year for five years for a total of a trillion dollars. Let me put it back down. And I said, yeah, uh, that what does this mean to you? And I said, you're a young couple and you have a mortgage on your house. And John, you brought this out at a, uh, at a meeting I was at several weeks ago with you. And you talked about uh, the young couple with a mortgage of $75,000 and how this accumulated deficit thus far of five trillion attributes to 2% of the interest that is on that perhaps 7% uh, mortgage that they have. And 2% means, you pointed out, that that couple on that $75,000 mortgage will pay an additional $37,000 over the 25 or 30 year uh, life of that, of that mortgage. Well, you know, if we let that deficit grow from five to trillion to six trillion, if we go along with the status quo, which we've been doing for years now, uh, it means that the debt service on that debt is going to get much, much bigger. And we reach a point of no return. $250 billion a year now just to maintain that debt. And if it goes to $370 billion in seven years, where's the money to help those people that truly need help? There just isn't any money there. So, you know, I just, uh, again, I, I point out that, uh, you know, this is the president's uh, budget request to us. It's blank. We don't have one. And that's a shame because, again, as the Washington Post editorial said this morning, the president ought to be here working with us towards a balanced budget. So, John, I just want to, again, take off my hat to you. You deserve a lot of credit, you and those budgeteers on your committee. They've done yeoman work, and uh, we wish you the best. We'll be there to help you all along well, the way. One, one word about the, the president's budget, and I've been kind of dying to say this. In 1993, when the president had his plan, um, it was, if you don't like our plan, give us your specifics. And you can remember these, the beatings that the members of the Budget Committee took from our, from our own internal debate. I mean, every time I tried to walk out of the room with a budget plan, somebody would tackle me in the hallway because they said, you cannot lay this down, John. We will get killed if you show us the specifics. And um, I used to be real young until I went through 1993. And um, finally, uh, and, and, and Debbie Price, Deb Price, who is here, knows, per, knows what I went through in 93 because she saw me on the airplane and uh, at home, and the, it was very difficult, but we did it. We laid our specific program out in 93. The president now is saying, hey, I did things for two years, and now it's kind of up to you, and I don't have to lay anything out that gets us to a balanced budget. Now, now, well, Joe, I'm going to tell you, when you go to the, when you go up into the, into the, this Boston baseball stadium, and they're going to let me have four swings at the bat, I'm swinging at the, I'm going to hit it over that green monster. I'm not going to, I'm not going to swing on two of the uh, times at the plate, and then the last two times I'm going to say, well, it's somebody else's job. I'm just disappointed the president hasn't given us a uh, road map to get to balance budget, and um, I, I feel very strongly about people who don't have it aren't in a very strong position to criticize those that do. And um, I think doing the right thing gives you a great reward, and I wish the president would fix his budget and get us a balanced budget by Thursday so it could be offered. 
Well, John, thank you very, very much. And uh, Mr. Goss, questions of the witness. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, might, might I interrupt just for one minute? We're going to uh, run this hearing right on through. We have an extensive list, and um, I'm going to go down and vote. You'll come take the chair, and uh, uh, members can choose to do likewise. Since the chairman has just had the first comment, in the interest of comedy and fair play, I think it's appropriate to yield now to Mr. Mokley. <laughs> well, actually, it's very difficult to, difficult to say anything bad about John Kitson. He's an outstanding person. He's a hard worker. He and I do disagree on certain philosophies, but nobody will ever say that uh, John has taken a position because it was easy to get there or, or anything else. So all I say is that. Uh, We'll get to the philosophy later, but it's always nice to see you here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I, I want to say that uh, I see Joe Moakley in the great traditions of the kind of Democrats that my father was, uh, concerned about working Americans. I mean, I think that uh, the, the, the Democrat Party has done some wonderful things in terms of standing up for people who haven't been stood up for before. Um, and I kind of look at this budget as one that ultimately stands up for people who nobody's standing up for, and that's working Americans. And, uh, but I, I want to tell you it's been a pleasure for me to be associated with you, and, um, and I say all that because um, I do want those tickets to that <laughs> Oh, and I thought you had an ulterior motive. <laughs> Thank you, John. The, uh, you know, I think it's terrific that everybody's going to get up to Fenway Park and watch the Red Sox, but I never realized that they gave four strikes away up there. That's terrific. No wonder they do so well every year. <laughs> Uh, when, you're, when you sit in the chairman's chair of this committee, it's important that you have a chart or a graph. I have a chart and a graph to bring out this morning. Mm. I staffed it. This is a very pretty green chart. Those are taxpayers' dollars and other dollars, government revenues. And the point I think you made, John, in your, in your testimony, and I want to make sure I'm clear on it, is that in 96, we're at the 1.5 trillion level and so forth. In the year 2002, we're, we're up uh, more like a 1.8. That's... Uh, you know, something in the neighborhood of 15, 20 percent growth in the budget. The key is that you can grow the budget to keep up with the growth of our country and provide jobs and prosperity and quality of life. And at the same time, you can balance the budget, as I believe what you've explained in your testimony. Because I, too, when these figures have been trotted out, people say, well, have you cut enough? And I think when this debate is over, we are going to find that, indeed, that we have made some discretionary cuts and that we have slowed growth in some of the entitlements. And I think those are very important distinctions, and I think you've wisely brought them to our attention. I uh, see that the chairman is back, so I guess I'll have to put my chart away now. Um, now I appreciate everything you've done, and uh, I am sure the debate uh, in the months ahead is going to profit from the wisdom and experience you've had over these many years. Uh, and if anybody has earned a right to have a say-so on this, it's you. I'm sorry the President of the United States is apparently not going to have his budget up there to give us uh, something else to work against. I believe now it would be Mr. Bielenson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Chairman, it's good to have you here. I was at the Red Robin in Calabasas over the weekend. A constituent of mine with <clears throat> Red Robin restaurant, which I often go to when I'm in Calabasas. Cousin of the Red, Red right, constituent of mine with two children was there. Restaurant. came over to me and said, listen to this said, uh, Congressman, uh, I'm a Republican, and I'm glad those Republicans are trying to balance the budget, but what about this nonsense about tax cuts? Let's, let's, let's get that budget down first. Let's get the deficit eliminated first, and then we'll worry about tax cuts. So I just want you to know there are some folks who feel differently about it, even amongst Republican constituents of ours. Uh, we're, glad to, we're glad to have you here. There's, um, it's always good to see you. You're always optimistic and smiling and uh, decent and thoughtful and civil. Uh, with respect to <clears throat> everything you do around here, and uh, it is a pleasure to deal with you. And, and quite frankly, and I hope it doesn't <clears throat> excuse me, hurt your credibility amongst your colleagues, I think it's fair to say that amongst the Democratic members of this place, that if the Republicans have to be in charge, which apparently they do this year because of the results of the, of the re elections last year, there's no one we'd rather have as chairman of the Budget Committee on your side uh, than, than yourself. I find, myself, I find myself of two minds about this whole thing, as perhaps some of my, my Democratic colleagues do. I, I, was, I was listening carefully to what our, our own chairman, Mr. Solomon, was saying earlier and agreeing with many of the things he said, although I obviously disagreed with some. I then listened to Mr. Moakley, our, our chief, and found myself in agreement with what he was saying 
Two, most especially, and I jotted down one thing he said, that the wrong people are getting, the reward, are getting rewarded and the wrong people are, are getting hurt. Uh, on, on, the one, on the one hand, you deserve an immense amount of credit, you yourself particularly, but all of you on, on your side of, of, uh, of the aisle, for, for trying to do the right thing. There's only one way to balance the budget, uh, and that's to do it. It's not by ba passing balanced budget amendments, which I know all of you are for. Also, but I'm really glad, frankly, if I may say so, and hope it doesn't offend Democratic colleagues of mine or Democrats out there in the, you know, out throughout the country, that once that failed, at least for the moment, that you went about doing what we would have had to have done anyway, even if it had passed. That is, we still would have had to cut spending, perhaps eventually even raise a few taxes, who knows. This only way you can actually do this, passing the amendment would never have done it by itself. And you deserve all the credit in the world for just, you know, grabbing the bull by the horns and going about trying to balance the budget in seven years or however many it may take, even though you didn't have a constitutional amendment, we didn't have one to force us to, to do that. Uh, what, what worries some of us, obviously, is that, is that you're, you're doing the right thing, but we're worried that perhaps you're going about it uh, in, in the wrong way. Few of us disagree that, 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 that <clears throat> the goal of balancing the budget over the next however many years, seven years, I think is perfectly reasonable, although I know some folks have said that there shouldn't be any particular timetable. I think you've got to have one, otherwise you won't get there. Uh, there are lots of different ways, obviously, to, to doing that. And the question that, that one has to ask, and which we'll continue to ask, obviously, even once the budget is passed, when we get to the specific spending bills and to the reconciliation bill later on in, in the year, is whether the plan overall provides for a fair and equitable way of, of balancing the budget. The answer to many of us quite clearly is no. I know that you would disagree, and, and that'll be fought out. Um, with the $350 billion over the first six, seven years of, 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 of tax cuts, monies which, on the whole, benefit the wealthy more than, than the non-wealthy and, and, the, and the big cuts in, in Medicare and student loans and dozens of other programs, the plan does in fact uh, provide for a large transfer of resources from the poor, and from the children, from the elderly to the wealthy. It's a plan that hurts those who need help the most from the government and helps those who need it the least. And in terms of social policy, if one can mix social policy and, and budget policy, as I think necessarily one has to, it doesn't make an awful lot of uh, sense. On top of that, the claim that it's good for the children is, is, is debatable. Well, on the one hand, obviously, if one reduces the deficits in the future, that's good for our children. What's not good for the children is if you bypass needed investments in education through cutting back on student loans or the health of themselves or, or the, the elderly or investing enough money in infrastructure and building our economy in ways which we're not putting enough money into. Many of us think at the federal level over these coming years, and it's going to be much more difficult because of the large cuts in discretionary spending, uh, you're not offering the kinds of opportunities to the coming generations that, that we, we need to offer them. Uh, it's, it's important for us to remind ourselves that spending by the federal government is important, some of it, but an awful lot of people depend on it in one way or another, and I'm not just talking about people on welfare, I'm talking about people who get student loans, talking about people who get who are helped by Medicare, people who are helped by, uh, by Social Security, millions of middle class and moderate income Americans depend to a certain extent or other on, on federal spending programs. We should be spending less on some of these programs, uh, but it's wrong to cut them uh, more than we otherwise would need to in order to, to give folks who are doing quite well uh, added tax cuts or even tax in incentives. There needs to be shared sacrifice here, and frankly, from the point of view of at least some of us, uh, that's what seems to be missing from your overall, from your overall plan. Uh, you know, we can argue about this, and I want to go back to what I said in the beginning. Uh, I think you deserve a lot of commendation and a lot of credit for forcing us to, to get or to try to get to a balanced budget in seven years. We still have strong arguments as to how to get there. Uh, there if, I know you'll argue strongly and I know you believe it, that, that we should continue the 300, try to get $350 billion in tax cuts. But if we could just put them aside for the moment, we could get there in a way that would hurt an awful lot of people much less than we're going to have to hurt them, get there in a far more equitable way. And I hope that along the line, especially since there seems to be some standing up or, or some, some problems, uh, some opposition to the, to the tax cuts over on the Senate side, that perhaps we'll end up with something which, which comes out to, to be more fair somewhat than, uh, than what you have uh, here uh, before us. So there won't be definite winners and losers, so that all of the American people will be winners as they can be, as you suggested earlier, if we in fact can get the, the budget into balance. I'm, I'm, um, Mr. Mr. S uh, Chairman, may I interrupt? You only have one minute to vote. Oh, and. Me... Uh, I, I, you're welcome. I know you've got another meeting to go to. Will you have other members of your budget committee, uh, Mr. Well, Shays I, and others? I'd like others? to vote and, and come right back okay. and, uh, and make a couple comments about this. I'll be back in a 
You go, go ahead Flash. and we'll, uh, we'll, right we'll hold it open for you. Okay, Mr. Uh, Sabo, would you mind uh, if uh, I, since you're going to take a little time, would you mind if I call on Mr. Shays and? Uh, we can be quick in the editor. Okay, that's all right. All right. He'll be right back. I know, but Mr. Shays will just finish right up, and uh, that way we won't hold the meeting. Can we go together, Mr. Chairman? If uh, both of Mr. Shays and Mr. Smith, both members of the Budget Committee, would uh, come forward, and uh, your entire statement will be submitted for the record, and without objection, will appear in the record. Feel free to summarize and state your piece. I guess we're done, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, both Nick Smith and I are here to uh, draw attention to the Gephardt rule that's referred to Rule 49, which automatically increases the national debt if you pass a budget resolution. And we would like your committee to deal with this issue uh, in either two ways. And I might just uh, let Mr. Smith. Well, I, I think uh, the two ways are either uh, by rule, uh, exempting the Rule 49, the, 49, the old Gebhardt rule, from its application to this budget resolution or make in order uh, the uh, House Resolution 138, which is the resolution that now uh, 40 of us have signed that does away with Rule 49 altogether. So either, either do away with Rule 49 permanently, which I think is consistent with our philosophy uh, in as much as the American people are going to be responsible for that debt so they should know how we're voting on it. or at least in the case of this budget resolution uh, uh, exempting Rule 49 from its application. We, we would like a separate rule on, the, on increasing the debt ceiling, and we think that should happen uh, after we not just vote on the budget resolution, but after we vote on reconciliation and show that we truly are getting to a balanced budget. <clears throat> well, let me say to both of you gentlemen, I certainly uh, share your view and your concern, and uh, uh, I was opposed to the Gephardt, uh, so-called Gephardt rule in the first place, because I believe in, uh, in raising the debt ceiling, that is one of the most important votes that you cast during uh, any tenure of uh, your, your two years in Congress. And uh, I don't know that we could, uh, we could repeal that rule on a permanent basis without having discussion, without talking about it on a bipartisan basis, and without perhaps even holding hearings on it. Uh, but I do share your view that we could suspend it for one year, and uh, we have been discussing that. Sure. I'll be discussing it with, with members on both sides of the aisle on our Rules Committee, and uh, whether we can make an amendment in order uh, or self-executed in the rule, I don't know at this point. But we would certainly pursue both of those avenues to see which uh, way would be best. And um, we hesitate to make an amendment in order because we announced in the past uh, that we would only entertain substitutes, full substitutes. And this would be breaking that uh, requirement and would open up uh, Pandora's box to other members that would want to offer other amendments as they would be entitled to. So we'll keep that in mind. We appreciate your coming before Mr. us. Chairman, One way like or the other, I believe that we will, we will help you. If I may turn in uh, for the uh, committee's uh, uh, perusal the sense of Congress language that was incorporated in the budget resolution right. suggesting this be accomplished. Right. And Mr. Kasich and an earlier member to call my attention to that uh, sense of Congress uh, language that is in the resolution. And perhaps we can go further and, uh, and making it permanent for one, for one year. If you can do that in the rules, that would be a We will, we will certainly take it under consideration. We appreciate your coming before us. Mr. Kasich, if you could come back. Uh, <clears throat> we have to go to uh, your colleague from Ohio, the... Uh, Former could judge, I, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, could I? I wanted to make a comment about the um, the comments that Mr. Bielenson made, and the, the first thing I want to talk about is Medicare. The last seven years, we spent 844 billion dollars on Medicare. If we continue without any changes in the law, we go to $1.8 trillion in Medicare. That will bankrupt the system. It is not a sustainable rate of growth and will bankrupt the trust fund. What we are proposing is that we go from $844 billion to almost $1.6 trillion in spending over the next seven years. And part of our frustration is but we're, we're, we're gaining on it, is that's not a cut in Medicare. That is just simply not a cut in Medicare. And then I wanted to talk for a second about student loans, because there have been some PR firms that have been hired out there that have spread some information to 
parents and students around the country. The only thing that the Republicans have done that affect basic loan programs is to say that when you get your loan, when you get your loan, the interest will begin to accrue. You will not pay the interest or the principal on that loan until you graduate, but when you get the loan, the interest will begin to accrue. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, including the fact that a college graduate has a significant increase in significant increase in earning ability when graduating from college. Um, but let me just give you the numbers. If you borrow the maximum for four years of college, which is $17,125, your monthly payment will go up by $45. If you borrow the maximum for two years, which is $11,000, your monthly repayment will increase by $21 or less than the cost of two compact discs. Um, this is all we do to the student loans. That's it. I mean, there's some individual loan programs that are out there that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that we impact. But in terms of the Pell Grant, in terms of the, uh, the basic program of loans, you know, Pell Grants goes to the poorest of our students. Uh, in terms of work study and all these other things, we don't impact them. This is the only provision that impacts um, higher education. So we have to be careful when we talk about entitlements that we're, we're not talking cuts when there are increases. And I understand that the gentleman would say, well, under current law, you would have to change the law in order to go from the 1.8 to 1.5, and that's for sure. Um, but I, I would say to the gentleman that if we, you know, we've got to do this. We've got to do it to save Medicare. We've got to, we've got to do this for a variety of reasons. But I needed to just correct the record on that. I appreciate it. If I'm, just for one quick second, if I may. Mr. Bielanson. Or should I not? No, go ahead. Okay. Let me just say one thing. I thought I was being rather kind in my it, comments to you. And I wasn't making too big a deal about some of these things. And I want to say very specifically, although it's obviously going to make all the difference in the world, not <coughs> how your committee, but how the other committees eventually slow down the rate of growth of Medicaid and Medicare. There's no question whatsoever that those are the two principal programs to which anybody has to look if they are serious about reducing the deficit. That's something we said ourselves two years ago. It's something the President himself said a couple of years ago, saying he'd bring down the deficit under our proposal last year, two years ago, which, which in fact we have. It's lower than it otherwise would have been. But unless we can get a, a hold somehow of these escalating, escalating costs of the, major, of the two major health care programs, uh, the deficits are going to go up again. And there are all kinds of arguments about how you go about doing that. And I think the President and the Administration are quite correct that we cannot look at these things in isolation, that you can't just talk about the public programs without dealing with reform across the board in health care, which is something some of your folks were not terribly helpful with last year, although our proposal wasn't all that great either. So there's some fault on, on, on both sides here. But in terms generally of looking at slowing down the rate of growth of Medicare and Medicaid, it absolutely has to be done. But there are different ways of doing it. And again, I express the hope that we find a way by the end of the year of doing that in as equitable a, a, a way as we yeah. possibly the only, can. The only reason, and I, uh, there's nobody that I've enjoyed serving with more than, than Mr. Bielenson because he is so fair and he supported some of the things I've done on the floor when we were in the minority. When we talk about entitlements, we tend to talk about cuts. And I think that in order to save the country, we have to get our language right. I mean, I got people over the weekend saying to me, John, can't you get it explained that something isn't a cut if it goes up? And so that's why every time we have a little thing we do, whenever anybody uses the word cut inside our caucus when it is not, they got to put a buck in the pot. And frankly, we got enough to, we got, we got more, in, more income now than, uh, than some small countries of the world. So. I, that's all. That's the only reason I'm saying for purposes of communicating, although I don't mean to understate, Mr. Bielenson, the fact that when you change the law, it's going to be different for some folks. And I, I don't mean to understate it, but yet it is still going up. That was my only point. And I don't mean to have the last word. So why don't you go well, ahead? we have to move on. Uh, Mrs. Price who's waited patiently. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I welcome my colleague uh, from Columbus, Ohio, Chairman Kasich, uh, to this historic day. 
Uh, and much of the history that's surrounding this day is accredited to Mr. Kasich. Uh, and you know that, Mr. Chairman. You've worked hard and long on your own budget proposals, and you know the kind of effort and energy that goes into them. And, and people like John Kasich and yourself, and with the new energy of our freshman class, uh, um, Mark Newman and others who are committed to this, I think it's, uh, it's great to be participating in this little bit of history today. I mean, we're actually doing what was unthinkable a year ago. And um, for that, we should all be grateful. Uh, I would just like to say that, you know, in terms of thinking about the future, it's very hard to get people to think about the future, especially politicians. With an election every two years, I think that's been our, our, our greatest hardship. Um, it, this country is not run like a business would be run. A business would never have run up this kind of debt, nor a family uh, would never have run up this kind of debt. And I think that we, um, as members of Congress, elected officials, have no greater responsibility, Mr. Chairman, uh, than to actually bring the truth of this to the American people. Now, Chairman Kasich just acknowledged how difficult it is if his pot in his own committee is almost full of dollar bills uh, from everybody who uses the word cut. That just shows us how much harder our job is. But it, we have to get the language right. I mean, it's just a complete misuse of the English language to be calling these things cuts when they're not. When we're going to $4,700 in Medicare uh, spending to $6,300 in Medicare spending, that is not a cut. That is an increase. And so we, we, whether it's being done as scare tactics or whether it's done uh, inadvertently, like so many of us are still want to do, uh, we, we just have to get past that. And I truly think that our seniors are going to appreciate our efforts to save Medicare. And once we get the language right, uh, they are going to come to know that we are trying to preserve and protect it and improve it because, as the President's own people are saying, this will be a bankrupt system in seven years if someone doesn't step in. And it's going to take some courage to make the changes that uh, we have to do, but I believe that that courage is, is um, present with us in, in, in the form of Mr. Kasich here and others across Capitol Hill that have um, uh, taken on this project and are willing to do the hard work. And to those of you who oppose this budget, I just would encourage you to have uh, the President submit his and to have Mr. Gebhardt submit his. So there we will have a debate over more than just uh, uh, Mr. Kasich and Mr. Solomons, and, and those are important documents and we need to see them. And if they, they should be made in order, and I'm very, very hopeful that they will be. Um, I just want to say that I believe that this, ba uh, this budget is, is, is truly a balanced budget, not just in terms of getting to zero in seven years, but it's balanced ideologically, uh, economically, and regionally. And that's very important because that is a consideration that we must take in order to get it passed. And so I, I congratulate the committee uh, for their hard work and their efforts. And I've watched uh, John Kasich since I knew him back in Ohio in the State House days when he was uh, a budgeteer and, and working on these same types of things. And it has become a passion with him. And his dogged determination is something we all ought to admire. And I thank uh, the chairman for his hard work. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. <clears throat> Mr. Frost. I have a question for Mr. Kasich and also a question uh, to the chairman of our committee uh, uh, because of the point just raised by the uh, gentlewoman from Ohio. There is a democratic budget that's been submitted to this committee uh, by my friend and colleague from the state of Texas, Mr. Stenholm. What is your position as to whether we should make that in order on the floor? I haven't seen the budget yet, uh, Mr. Frost. I don't know what's contained in it, but uh, I was asked my opinion of it this morning and uh, said I haven't had a chance to look at it, to think about it, but I'll certainly have an opinion on it before we uh, get to the floor. I wasn't asking the question on the merits. I was asking, should this committee make an order on the floor a vote on the Stenholm budget? I don't know what's in the Stenholm budget. I mean, how can I tell you I'm going to... Well, you, that I'm for everyone on your side has been seen. complaining that there isn't a democratic budget. There is a budget that has been submitted to this committee by a very... Uh, by a conservative member of our own caucus, a very conscientious member, and he's asking that it be made in order, and that uh, I'm just asking you whether you think that uh, that Democratic budget should be, have the opportunity to get a vote on the floor. Well, as soon as I have a chance to take a look at it and, and, um, and think through, Mr. Frost, uh, the kind of detail that's in the budget and does it in fact get to zero and is it CBO scored, 
I'll be glad to have an opinion on that. Well, I can but, give you a capsule. But, and but Mr. What, what I will say is, is that it is uh, mind-boggling to me uh, that the leadership of your party and the President of the United States has no budget. Now, the fact that, I mean, I compliment anybody that takes the time to put a budget together, but um, uh, the so, issue so that some we Democrats are better than is uh, what the President and what the, uh, the leadership of your party so some, some Democrats are better than other Democrats that you don't want to necessarily commit to making a conservative Democratic uh, budget in order. Are you concerned about the number of votes that it would attract? Let me, if I, if I, if I might, uh, I'm not exactly involved right now in terms of studying other budgets. Uh, I'm actually involved right now in trying to pass the budget that is that can pass this House and that can save the country. Well, Mr. Kasich, uh, I don't uh, have time for. Uh, for monkeying around with a bunch of other stuff out there. I mean, frankly, I'm working as many hours as I can, and uh, but I will take a look at his budget whenever I have it, have it, have a moment. Well, Mr. Kasich, his be... budget uh, achieves uh, a balanced budget without a tax in, without a tax cut, and uh, he's trying to do the same type thing that uh, some of your Republican colleagues are trying to do in the United States Senate, and uh, that's a very clear-cut choice uh, between the product that your budget. <laughs> your committee has produced and what some members of your own party and some members of my own party think is a good idea. If I might uh, just uh, intercede in the, uh, in the debate and uh, say to the gentleman from Texas that, uh, as he knows, uh, I had asked uh, that uh, amendments uh, in the nature of a substitute be filed with this committee as of 5 o'clock on Monday, giving everybody ample time. This was done uh, early last week. And uh, the, um, at 5 o'clock on Monday, there were only two amendments filed timely. Uh, one was Mr. Newman and uh, the so-called Newman-Solomon substitute. The other was uh, a substitute by uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Vyslovsky, which is really not, uh, not a substitute. It's just a simple sense of Congress. All of the others uh, were, uh, were filed late and uh, even at this point we still don't have all of the uh, the numbers uh, in, in, a, in a finished document. However, I've taken what we do have. Uh, we are not going to uh, disqualify anybody. For instance, Mr. Dingell never got his in until uh, very, very, very late and uh, I'm not sure we still have all the, uh, the numbers on that, but uh, we are not going to preclude it. In addition, uh, uh, we have to determine how many of these substitutes we are going to make in order. Uh, we may make uh, two Republican uh, alternatives in order, certainly the committee uh, uh, product and uh, probably the, uh, the Newman-Solomon uh, uh, substitute uh, on the Republican side. On the uh, Democrat side, there are four uh, by Voslowski, uh, Owens, uh, Stenholm, and Dingell. And, uh, we will no doubt make uh, at least one of those in order. And in addition, we will give uh, Mr. Gephardt uh, the right, uh, probably in a rule, to, to offer whatever resolution he wants to offer. And uh, if he wants to offer that on behalf of the uh, Democrats uh, uh, and the, uh, the particular substitute you're talking about, uh, I don't know for sure. We have to take that into consideration. We're going to recess and talk to our leadership, and we'll be talking to your leadership about it as well. Oh, but uh, uh, probably we would end up with four alternatives, and uh, that could certainly be one of them. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would consider it to be uh, extreme uh, irony if Stenholm were not made in order. Mr. Stenholm was the author of the balanced budget constitutional amendment that got two-thirds in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Stenholm has been a member of the Budget Committee for six years. Uh, when we were in the majority, uh, we always permitted uh, several Republican substitutes, including one, uh, I believe, was it, uh, was it Dannemeyer? There was one that, that never even got very many votes and clearly didn't have a majority support in your own caucus, but we always let it be offered. Uh, and Mr. Stenholm has worked on this, as Mr. Kasich knows, for years and was the, was the author of the constitutional amendment that actually passed the House. Well, Mr. Frost, I have to correct you. There is no Stenholm amendment pending before us. There, uh, uh, Mr. Stenholm removed his name from the pending substitute before this body, and it now uh, carries the name of, uh, of Orton. I believe it's Mr. Orton who, uh, if we make one in order at all, it will probably, uh, we will tell Mr. Gephardt to, uh, you know, he can, he can take his pick if he wants to. 
Well, clearly, no. uh, clearly, Mr. Stenholm uh, has worked very long and hard uh, with the other members of other conservative Democratic members, uh, and quite frankly. Uh, whether it has Orton's name on it or whether it has Stenholm's not, name on it is not particularly material. The question is whether well, conservative Democrats who, who want to balance the budget without the $345 billion tax cut for the wealthy, whether they have the opportunity to do that or not. And I, I would hope well, that they do have that opportunity, even if it loses on the floor. We will certainly take the gentleman's uh, recommendations into consideration, but I'm going to pursue why Mr. Stenholm removed his name from the substitute. I don't know why that would have happened. Uh, are you finished, sir? I'm through. Okay. Uh, Mr. Diaz Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think we have an obligation. Uh, I know the gentleman also wanted to make an opening statement, and we were right. able to do that at the time. And uh, feel free to uh, speak. To well, it's, I'm, I'm honored, as we all are, that uh, Chairman Kasich is here, and, and uh, I, I, uh, I think we all have an obligation to uh, uh, to be uh, learning. Uh, as leaders as much as we can, but we also have an obligation to lead. And uh, I want to thank uh, Chairman Kasich for his perseverance. You uh, have been not only working hard on this issue, you've been teaching us here uh, as to <clears throat> the uh, process by which a budget is put together and connecting that process with the importance, uh, the need to put together a budget. Today I was, Mr. Chairman, I was reading an article, an editorial rather, in the Miami Herald this morning uh, about uh, the elections the uh, day before yesterday in, uh, in Argentina. And the headline, the title here is Inflation Buster Wins Again. Uh, Menem, the uh, president of Argentina, follows trend. Across Latin America, it's the hard money guys who win elections regardless of the fiscal pain. Now this process that's been going on in other parts of the world has been very interesting because in countries like Argentina, which in the 50s, for example, were extraordinarily prosperous and was one of the breadbaskets of the world, and yet there were economic meltdowns. I mean, there was a serious economic meltdown there as there, were, as there, as there was, for example, in, in Brazil, in this hemisphere, and in Peru. And then the sacrifice that was required to put those economies in order were, those sacrifices were extraordinary. Matter of fact, it was felt that the people who decided to implement sacrifice was called shock therapy, like Menem in Argentina, that they just couldn't do it. And much less would, could they get reelected because of the pain that that shock therapy would entail. There, countries like that, where there were economic meltdowns, they didn't have to only cut the growth of government. I mean, they had to savagely cut the size of the, of, of, of the public sector, really hurting the, 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 uh, the most uh, needy in society, and do it in a way that was extraordinarily difficult. What we're looking at now at this historic moment, Mr. Chairman, is sacrifice that will be minimal when compared to the sacrifice that would be required by the people of the United States if we do not act now. We're not talking about substantial cutbacks in the size of the public sector. As Chairman Kasich was saying, we're talking about reducing the rate of growth, reducing the rate of growth of the federal government. I really think, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we are uh, at a, a fork in our national destiny, and it doesn't happen very often. We could, we could embark upon the course of uh, uh, hiding our heads in the sand and simply ignoring uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the fiscal realities before us. Or we could uh, do what, uh, what we need to do and what I think is the objective and the goal of Mr. Kasich's budget and put us on the path towards, uh, like you were saying, uh, John, um, a situation where our kids and their kids uh, we'll be able to enjoy an economy, and I like your phrase, where people can fly. I'll never forget that phrase, because that's what I see as the United States of America. That you can create a job, you can create a business, you get out of school, you can have a job. It's not a situation where 
country after country after country, even when you graduate from college, graduate, even if you have a PhD degree, you see people uh, doing things that have nothing to do with what they studied. And we in America have not had that situation because we've had the premier economy uh, in the post-war era. But we've got to save that for our children and their children. And that's why I really think that, you know, even though it's going to be real tough and look, you know, we've got to look at these details, I feel that, that we're at a historic moment. I want to thank you, John, for your leadership, for your teaching on this, because that's part of leadership, your perseverance. And, and I really think that if we don't act now and take the, you know, the right fork on the road, if we become the ostrich and, 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 and hide our heads in the sand once again, we will really be doing a disservice to our children and their children. Because in 10 or 20 years, the sacrifice that will be needed here, Mr. Chairman, will be similar to the sacrifice that we've seen in other countries that were prosperous before, like Argentina, and there there was real pain and real sacrifice. And we're not talking about cutting rate of growth there. We're talking about really uh, cutting uh, the, uh, the public sector. So we're doing the right thing. I think we're on the right side of history. And so I want to thank uh, the chairman uh, uh, of the Budget Committee for his hard work. And, um, and I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, uh, permitting me uh, this, uh, uh, these, uh, this statement. Mr. Chairman, let Mr. me just Kasich. quickly say to the gentleman that um, I, I think this is really about our last chance. And the reason I say it is is that we have the freshmen and the sophomores who are committed to making hard choices. Uh, I saw the gentlelady from a former member from Pennsylvania last night talking about the fact that at some point you've got to be prepared to fall on your sword. And um, I think we have that. I think we have the leadership of people in the front who want to get this job done. And I think the American people are in a, in a mode now, as long as the plan's across the board, to give. And that's precisely what the plan is. Let me just say that Argentina was experiencing hyperinflation. Carlos Menem went in, took dramatic actions. Inflation now is about 4 or 5 percent in Argentina. And he was expected to have a close race. He avoided a runoff. And in the words of one lady, um, voter down there with her children, she said, well, I heard the other talk, but frankly what it got down to was economic security. And Menem's given us economic security, and that's why I want him to stay in power. And we don't do it now. I, I don't, I just, I mean, we might as well, we're, we're in bad, bad shape. There'll have to be another, uh, I don't know when the opportunity will come again, and that's what I worry about for the country. Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Kasich, John, I, I like a lot of your colleagues, uh, you know, admire your guts, your determination. I must say, I, I don't admire what you're doing from the standpoint of, of the cuts. And I, I call them cuts because our population is not decreasing. We've got more and more people that are coming on the rolls, and that's what the projection's all about. So, in essence, to me, it's a cut. Now my question is, the budget is more to me, and I think a lot of us in this country, than just numbers. It's about people. And it's more than just charts that we, sh that we show. You've got charts, the chairman's got charts, we got charts. But the, the budget is about people. And it's about families. And I keep hearing you and other people say, this is a family-friendly budget. I fail to see where it's family friendly. I don't have anybody calling my office from my district in Ohio, which is close to your district, that's saying I'm a, I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a, I'm a father, I'm a mother, and I really love your budget because this is really fr family friendly. It's really helping me. Matter of fact, in Ohio, this is put out by the White House. In Ohio, they project we'll lose, uh, in 2002 alone, we'll lose $2.6 billion in Medicare. We'll lose $9 billion over seven years. It's going to be an average tax, tax increase for about 400,000 working families in Ohio of about $1,500 a year. I'm sorry, $1,500 over seven years. And for Ohio students, approximately 210,000 of them will have to pay at least 3,000 more in cost. These are medium, these are medium costs. So why is this family friendly? If people are going to have less, if, and when we talk about Medicaid, 
We talk about school lunch program. We talk about the WIC program, which are going to be cut. We're talking about people that are going to have to re that that are going to be hurt, and I and I think they're going to be severely hurt. And I I hesitate. I I can't see where this is family friendly. So, but I must say I admire your determination because you're not you're not uh, you're nothing is sacred to you in this budget, and uh, you show a lot of guts, a lot of determination. I say that realizing that I, I don't think there's anybody in this committee that doesn't want to see the deficit cut. We must do it. The question is how. I mean, you're cutting it all at once. It's the baby going out with the bathwater, as far as I'm concerned. The gentleman knows the, the better than I do, because the gentleman kind of taught me at times the old saying that whatever you do, the, you'll be judged by whatever you do to the least of mine. A biblical phrase. And I know of the gentleman's faith, and I think the gentleman knows of mine. And I also have to tell you that it's where I come from. I got into politics because I didn't like people having their lives controlled by forces beyond their own control. I mean, the wind blew the wrong way, somebody was out of work in my neighborhood. Let's talk about some of the specifics of the questions the gentleman raised. First of all, school lunch. The school lunch program goes up by 4.3%. Everybody right now in the school lunch program, including the kids from the richest areas of Dayton, get like a 19 cent subsidy on school lunch. It's ridiculous. Now, John, if you talk to your school lunch program director and administrator, they'll tell you that they're going to have to cut. I don't know of a school lunch administrator in this country that won't be able to do it with the projections of new people coming on that won't have to cut the school well, lunch program. But, but no, the, no. And most no, school the, districts are eliminated because they is can't afford we, it. We don't want to give school lunches to the subsidies to rich kids, to rich parents' children. I mean, we're going to reach, we're going to change it. We're going to say, if you're poor, if you have nothing, you're going to get help. Then why do you have a tax cut that gives but, but a me, tremendous me, amount me, of benefits to we wealthy come back, people? We can address each of these issues because I think they're important. The school lunch program goes up by 4.3%, and it says that people above the 150% of poverty, I mean, frankly, 20% of our program will go to people who are still middle income. I mean, I think when I was a student in school and my dad carried mail on his back, I could pay for my own school lunch. I didn't need the federal government to pay for my school lunch. And what our program says is we will target the money to the poorest kids. And I think that's the way it ought to be. Let's talk about the growth in caseload. The growth in the caseload of Medicare is about one, one and a half percent. I mean, we accommodate that. I mean, I would say to the gentleman that if we keep doing what we're doing and practicing fee-for-service medicine, Medicare will go bankrupt. And the people who are working now in, at Wright-Patterson or at the factories who are paying Medicare right now, they won't get any. Frankly, under this plan, we only save Medicare for about 15 years, and then we got this big wave that comes. I don't know what we're going to do. Somebody's going to have to come and fill in Congress and do stage two at some point. I don't think I'll be around here that long. But what we're suggesting in Medicare, and I mean, I'll hit the nail on the head. I mean, some people in my party don't like me to talk about it. We have to look at what they're doing in the private sector, which is that you can maintain a fee-for-service system, but you also can develop coordinated care. Frankly, most people today in America are in coordinated care. The only people that are not in coordinated care are the senior citizens, and they're in it in some places, and frankly, they're able to get prescription drugs and eyeglass coverage. It's, it's a system that's serving them well. So with Medicare, if we don't slow the growth, it goes bankrupt. Let's talk about students. I don't think it is unreasonable to say to a student, when you get a student loan, the interest on the loan is going to begin to accumulate, and it's going to cost you 20 bucks a month more when you graduate. We're not taking away Pell Grants. We're not talk taking away work study. We're not ta taking away campus-based aid. Why is this family, family friendly, though? That well, was my question. For one basic reason. If we don't get our, if we don't get this under control, everybody says, you said it, I'm for balancing the budget. Well, the only way to balance the budget is to, is to make choices, which is what we've done. I mean, nobody's off the table. You know what? The ag people are mad because they say they're being hit. The urban people are mad because they see they're being hit. The students say they're mad because they're being hit. The big corporations and the loopholes, they say they, they're being hit. I mean, everybody's complaining. That's how I know it's right. 
because everybody's saying that they're, they're part of the solution here. But what's the bottom line? Tony, in my mind, I don't believe that wealth and opportunity is created. Wealth is not created by government. Opportunity can be helped by government. That's why we didn't go in and take a meat cleaver and say, take the student loans and throw them out. We haven't done that. Title I in primary and secondary education. We've centralized the block grants, but every schoolhouse in America will still get Title I money. I mean, it, it's, it's in there. So I don't think it's fair to say that we have somehow uh, hit these programs and such and we've, and we've hurt people. I, I mean, I just don't see it in here. Why is it family friendly? Why are, we against the, why are you against the family tax credit? Of all the people in this Congress that understand the importance of family, now, you may take a, take a, a, a fight with whether it should be $200,000 or not. But, I mean, the fact that we're going to tell a guy who's making $43,000, he's got three kids, he's going to have $1,500 off his income tax, that's great. I mean, if there's anything we ought to be encouraging in this country, it's the family. I mean, you know that and I know that. We believe that passionately. And in terms of capital gains, I mean, this business of rich and poor, I, I, I mean, it's just wrong. I mean, I never thought that because somebody was going to invest and create something that somehow that was, that was shafting me. Well, John, you know, I could bring a chart here and show you that the, the gap between the rich and the poor is widened. I, and I, that's... It, it's come as a result of the 1980s. And I sincerely believe, as a result of this budget, if it would pass the way it is, that gap is even going to be much wider. But a lot of middle class people and lower middle class people are going to be thrown into that pot more on the poor end. I, I believe that with all my yeah. heart. But I mean, and I think that I think that our budgets have to be more than than they're, charts and numbers. They're, they're not about, about people. numbers. You you quoted you quoted scripture to me at the beginning, and I'll just give you a little scripture from, and I'll paraphrase from James, the first chapter. The guy is trying to bring somebody to the Lord. He's and and I'm paraphrasing the guy, and the guy says. Uh, you know, I'm hungry. I'm hurting. The guy's saying, well, you need to go find God. You need to do this. And the fact is, is that he's not helping this guy. And he's not going to bring anybody to anybody, to anything, when it comes to religion. My point that I'm trying to make is, is that we can't look at people and say, look, I know you're hurting, but the numbers are going to put you, you're going to make you more hungry. It's going to, it's going to hurt, but I know in the long run it's going to make you feel good. We need to help them now. I think that's what James is all about. What good does it do with our rhetoric and our charts if, in fact, we're going to hurt people? And, I, and I, I sincerely believe, John, if your budget passes the way it is, it's going to hurt a heck of a lot of people. The gap between the rich and the poor is going to get wider. And it's not going to happen for a while. It's, it's going to take years for all this to develop as all these programs go back to the states. I admire your determination and your guts. You're a very gutsy guy. But this is a hurting, hurting budget. Well, let me, let, me, let me first of all say that in terms of the, um, in terms of the issue of the budget being numbers, budget has never been numbers with me. That's why I do the budget. It has nothing to do with numbers. It has to do with vision. Now, let's talk about the welfare. Let's talk about the welfare bill. I mean, we've already covered school lunch. Let's talk about the welfare bill. You know, where I come from, it's a sin not to help people who need help. It's equally a sin. It's equally a sin to help people that ought to help themselves. We're not denying anybody food. That hungry person that you quoted, where are they not going to get the food? We're not taking their food away. What we're doing is we're going to go total federal spending. To, and and I, listen, I know where you're coming from. These are not just numbers and they're not just t charts. They're about the vision of this country. We're going to go from $9.4 trillion in spending to about $11 trillion in spending. Let me see. Yeah, right here. We're going to go, Mr. Hall, from $9.4 trillion to $11.8. It's not going down. I mean, how can we say that this is some 
some tough-fisted budget when we're going up by two trillion dollars. And listen. Yeah, but you're trying to tell people that you're that you're trying to tell people that this is not a cut. This is really an increase. Well, the fact no, no, no. Is, some things the are fact cut. is, there's going to be an increase in population. There's going to be more and more people become elderly. That's the problem. We accommodate that. That's going to be a cut for them. Over seven and years, the benefits are going to have to be. Cut. Wait a minute. Over seven years, Medicare will grow at the end of the day by about 5%. The increase in caseloads only about one, one and a half percent. I mean, it's just not true. I, I just can't accept it because it isn't true. And frankly, I believe that our senior citizens can find themselves in an environment where they get more. You know what, in California, they find themselves in systems where they get prescription drugs covered, they get eyeglasses. I mean, they like the system. And, and what we're trying to do is to preserve it. But look, mm -hmm. let's go back. Tony, we're at 9.4 to 11.8 trillion. I mean, how much more do you want to spend? John, I don't have any senior citizens or families or poor people calling my office and say, I love this budget. This is family friendly. Do it. Well, you know, you know who calls the office? The people who are hooked on the status quo and the people who benefit from the cottage industries across this country. I'm not talking about the recipients of programs, but I'm talking about those people who have an interest in preserving the status quo. How can, we can't go anywhere under the status quo. It's going to sink us. There's nobody that doesn't say it isn't going to sink us. Nobody disagrees with If, that. if but, I but, can uh, get back to, the, uh, to what this hearing is all about, and we are discussing the proposals before us. And Tony, uh, uh, I just have to ask you to yield to, uh, to answer your question about um, is the, the Casey proposal uh, family friendly, and where is the family friendly proposal? And we're supposed to be holding a hearing here. Uh, I had asked uh, the president uh, by letter more than a week ago to, uh, through Leon Panetta, the former chairman of the Rules Committee, uh, John's predecessor, uh, to submit to us a budget. Uh, and we would make that budget in order. Now, this is the president's request that he gave to us back in February. And this might be family friendly. I, I don't know. It increases uh, the deficit by a trillion dollars. Now. I just have to call attention to, and I'm going to read part of this, to the editorial in the Washington Post. This is not a friendly newspaper to Republicans, particularly conservative Republicans like me. But it says which budget, and after all, that's what we're here today trying to determine how we're going to debate which budgets. It starts off by saying, Democratic complaints about Republican budget plans will continue to have a hollow and unpersuasive ring until the Democrats begin to come up with specific alternatives of their own. It goes on to say, until then, they will merely seem to be defending the present spending pattern with its succession of $200 billion a year deficits reaching as far as the eye can see. Here, 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 and on in to the year 2025. Now, it says, eminent Democrats denounced the Republican proposals for spending cuts as mean-spirited, not family-friendly, and wrong. But, and this is them saying this, do the Democrats have anything better to offer? Mr. Clinton can't have forgotten that he himself ran successfully against those big budget deficits three years ago. I won't go on to read the rest of this, but... I like to just say that I agree with that editorial. I think it's right. I hope by I hope by the week is out we do have a budget. I I hope that we have several substitute well, Tony, budgets. I don't agree with the fact that we're sitting back and not saying anything. I think that in fact we will. And um, can I, I tell you what I, Alan Green, I agree with that editorial? Disagree. Let me just tell you what Alan Greenspan said. He came before the committee and I said to him, "What happens if we balance the budget by 2002?" And he gave me this economic mumbo jumbo and I said no 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 explain it to people who who are not like PhDs in economics would you and he said two things Tony he said number one if we can balance the budget by 2002 we will unleash a prosperity in this country that we cannot chart secondly he says we will kill the fear in the sides of in in the insides of mothers and fathers that their children will not be as as better off better off than they were. I mean, that's what it is. It's about like bringing interest rates down, creating economic growth. It, that's what you get if you do this. I, I agree, John, and I, and I, and I don't want to prolong it. 
uh, my district has 3% unemployment. Uh, maybe it might be 3.2. I mean, that's that we don't even, we consider that full employment. We're doing very, very well. And what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. Do we need to reduce the deficit? Absolutely. It's how you do it. I mean, it's wham, bam. I mean, you hit everything real hard. I mean, there's no, there's no leeway. There's no, there's no uh, consideration for what I consider programs that, that really hurt people. And I think you just cut them, cut them, some, in some cases eliminate them. And I think that's very hurting. Mm. And I don't think, a matter of fact, I believe this, it's not a family-friendly budget. It's just the opposite. Well, gentlemen, I, I have to move on to another uh, uh, question there. But, uh, Tony, I, I'll just say to you that, uh, you know, we are going to recess this hearing at the end of this hearing. And it would be my hope that this committee could, could enact a, a resolution, a rule, that would give Mr. Gephardt the opportunity to offer that family-friendly budget. And if you've got that, uh, I, would, I would advise you to pursue it with Mr. Gephardt. Uh, hopefully, we can, uh, we can come up with that. Mrs. Walholtz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Kasich, I just want to tell you that, uh, that I admire your efforts. It is very easy to get people to say that in the abstract we need to balance the budget. 300 members of this House earlier this year voted for a balanced budget amendment. They stood up and said we've got to balance the budget, but it is very difficult to get people to vote for a specific, concrete budget that balances. And I admire your efforts and the efforts of your committee to step forward and be willing to move from the abstract, which is very popular and very easy to support, to the concrete, which requires some real courage. And so I appreciate the efforts that you've all had to make. I'm not comfortable with every recommendation in the Budget Committee's resolution, and I would venture to guess that you personally are probably not 100% comfortable with every recommendation. You'd have a problem if you were happy with all of it. That's right. But that's what the rest of the budget process is about. That's why we'll spend the rest of the summer and into the fall going through the budget and appropriations and reconciliation process so that we can begin to make some other value judgments within these broad parameters over the summer. And we'll have an opportunity to look at what our values and our priorities are and to reflect that in the final document. But it's about time that this body was honest with the people in this country and demonstrated what it will take to balance the budget in the next seven years. And I think the budget resolution that your committee has come forward with is an honest document and makes us face squarely the problems that the spending patterns that the last several decades have created for the people in this country. Now, let me just say, I think it's important to note that you, when you were the minority ranking member, stepped forward with budget alternatives that were specific that this body was able to vote on. We do not have a budget from the president before us that balances. If we were to enact the president's budget as it stands today, we would not only add a trillion dollars to our national debt, but in seven years, senior citizens couldn't go to the hospital and couldn't get home health care because Medicare goes bankrupt. That's the budget the president has presented to us. More debt and a Medicare system that goes bankrupt. It means that seniors can't get help in seven years. We don't have a budget alternative that Mr. Gephardt or Mr. Bonnier or any other ranking minority member of any committee is willing to put their name to that balances the budget by 2002. And I think the American people need to realize that they have not been presented with other alternatives because no one's willing to step forward from the Democratic leadership and put their name to it. I hope that the President and Mr. Gephardt change their mind in the next couple of days. I know the committee is going to try to leave that opportunity open as long as possible. But it's time that the American people had choices that, that represented real choices and not demagoguery from the side, sniping at your efforts without offering anything positive of their own. So I admire what you've done. I appreciate the work of the committee. Now the Rules Committee is going to be able to do its part in ensuring that we only send budgets to the floor that balance by 2002 so that the work of your committee will go forward. And I thank you for your efforts. Mr. Quillen of Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kasich, I, I don't know of any other person in the Congress I admire more than I do you. First of all, your directness, your ability, and what you say is really 
<coughs> guiding light and should be to all of us. I held an open door. An open door in my district is where I go into courthouses with my staff and we see the people one-on-one. -on -one. A former state representative came in to see me Saturday. I served with him later when he was in the legislature. A friend of mine. He says it's time to stop spending. Cut it out. Because if you don't cut it out, the grandchildren today are going to be burdened with a $185,000 tax burden. Everything in this country, both the county governments, the city governments, and the state governments and individuals, look to the federal government for solutions and money to enhance their livelihood. The federal government is too big, we know that. It's got to be trimmed, it's got to be scuttled to a degree because it's getting out of hand. And if we don't do it and make hard choices, then this country will not be the freedom-loving country that we enjoy today. I know I don't agree with the all the provisions in this budget resolution. Probably you don't either, John. I don't think you'll find 100% agreement on everything. But it's time to make decisions, and decisions should be made. That opened my eyes when this gentleman, whom I know very well, came in to see me Saturday, and I accused him of preaching. But then after I thought it over, He's right. We can't have money uh, at every angle from the federal tit. We know that. Because that money comes from us. It comes from the people of this nation with increased taxes, slows down our economy. Uh, business and industries can't expand because overburdened with taxes. So it's time that we opened our eyes and we did something about it, and that's why I admire you. I don't know the people in your district. I don't know whether they agree with all your views or not. They must. They send you back. But it's time that we thought about this very seriously. And when I've been asked before, I said, I have misgivings about the budget resolution. I don't like your recommending cutting out the federal dollars from TVA. I don't like the fact that you're cutting out EDA. I don't like the fact that you're cutting out ARC, the Appalachian Regional Commission, because it covers the poor areas of my district. I don't like many things, but if we liked everything, we'd be like those preaching that we can't cut, that we got to add on, and we got to do this, and we got to do that. So it's time for a reckoning, and this budget resolution is that day of reckoning, and I commend you. That means, I just want to say, Ms. Quillen, that, that statement, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Uh, John. Uh, Mr. Linder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> John, you've done a remarkable job. Um, I wish we were arguing with the other side in more specifics. Tony said that we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and from my experience here, a lot of this bathwater don't have any babies in it. It's been here too long and needs to go. This is a family-friendly budget because it's preserving an opportunity for our children and grandchildren. How much further can we go with debt? What is propping up the value of the dollar other than confidence? And if we don't get control of our financial house and we lose the confidence of the investors in the American dollar, it crashes just like the peso did. And is that family friendly? Does that help senior citizens? Does that help the young people? The fact of the matter is we need to show the investment community that we're serious about our responsibilities and that we will get this budget into balance and we will grow the economy. With respect to the tax measures, John, I believe you said 75% of the child tax credit goes to those making 75,000 or less. With respect to the 
capital gains. Isn't it true that about 57% of the capital gains filings will be to people with $75,000 in income or less? I, I've seen that reported, but I, I don't have those facts in front of me. But when we cut capital gains in 1977, isn't it true that the revenues from that category increased in every succeeding year? That's correct. Until 1987, the year after we increased it, and then the revenues declined? That's correct. Is it also true that there's six to ten trillion dollars in money in this country and assets being held because the cost of transacting a sale is too expensive? That's correct. And when those transactions occur, they create capital for job creation. I've, I've said for years that Jimmy Carter ought to get a great deal of the credit for the 19 million net new jobs created during the 80s because it was the capital gains cut that created the venture capital pools that allowed the capital to be there to create new jobs. Big corporations didn't create those jobs. Small businesses did. And I believe the capital gains tax cut will increase the money available in venture capital pools. It's worth remembering that in 1977, $50 million in all the venture capital pools combined. And in 1986, before we increased it, it was $5 billion in venture capital pools. I don't know uh, if the gentleman would yield. I, I know that John Kennedy cut the marginal rates. I believe that he cut the capital gains rate as well in the 1960s. I know he cut marginal rates, and that's where, uh, where uh, that, whole, that whole expression, a rising tide lifts all boats, comes from. And Jimmy John Carter, Kennedy's actions. Carter in 77 cut capital gains and did a tremendous amount to make capital available for job creation. And isn't that what family friendly is all about? The kids coming out of school and out of college can have a job and they can make as much of what they wanted themselves from that job. Thanks for what you're doing, John. Well, John, I want to thank you again for coming here. It is an historic occasion, and uh, the whole meaning of this, uh, this hearing that I got from you is that uh, uh, we are not discussing whether to balance the budget. We are discussing how to do it. Uh, and that is what's going to happen in the next 48 hours. And uh, I just uh, wish you all the best. We'll be there to help you in every way that we can. And the people who are concerned about this and support what we're trying to do should call. Just like Reagan said, call. Well, Absolutely. this is your chance. Weigh in. Uh, there he is on the wall up there. And uh, I think he's watching right now. Thank you, John. The uh, next witness, and I apologize for his having sat there for... Uh, several hours uh, is the distinguished uh, former chairman of the uh, budget committee and uh, now the ranking democrat uh, mr martin olive sabo of minnesota and uh, we appreciate your coming before us feel free to summarize and uh, your entire statement would appear in the record if you see fit to without objection well thank you mr chairman i i do not have prepared statements so let me just make a few comments and be happy to to uh, respond to any of your questions uh, First of all, let me deal very specifically with uh, what you're hearing. I expect you're really not hearing the substance of the budget resolution, but the process by which we consider it. I would only simply request that there be significant time uh, uh, for a general debate on the budget resolution. I believe in 1993 we had 10 hours of general debate. Uh, regardless of what we may think of its merits, it is a large and it is a significant package. And I would suggest uh, a similar amount of time, at the minimum even more, for general debate so that uh, both uh, the members and uh, the general public can be become educated to, to what its contents are. Uh, I would also uh, indicate my support for, uh, in response to the question Mr. Frost uh, indicated earlier, in particular would request that uh, uh, the Orton substitute and the Black Caucus substitute be made in order with an uh, appropriate amount of time uh, for debate. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as it relates uh, to the budget itself, uh, uh, two years ago I was here asking for a rule on a, a budget that uh, provided for over $500 billion of uh, deficit pr uh, reduction. Uh, we passed that budget. I must say that uh, we passed it with all Democratic votes. There were dire predictions as to what was going to happen to the economy if we passed it. Those predictions were wrong. The economy responded. We had incredible growth of jobs and investments in this country. Unemployment is way down. Inflation is stable. And, uh, and the economy responded to the budget we passed uh, two years ago in a very positive fashion. So we meet today with continuing problems in our economy, but not a crisis. 
problems we face are twofold. Uh, uh, more than twofold, but I think there are two central ones. Uh, uh, clearly, we're an economy uh, where the disparity in income between rich and poor is growing, and that's been going on for 20 years. Uh, the old statement that the rising tide raises all boats simply has not applied the last 20 years uh, in the fashion it did from the end of World War II until about 20 years ago. And so we find a growing disparity between uh, rich and poor in this country. We find this a budget resolution that starts with an assumption that we do a very significant tax cut as we go in the process of also balancing the budget. Clearly, those who benefit the most from that tax cut are the most affluent uh, in this country. And then we have a series of program changes some clearly impacting health care in a very substantial way, both Medicare and Medicaid, uh, that would ha require rather substantial restructuring of those programs in such a fashion, in my judgment, that goes to quality of service, and a whole series of other budget decisions that accumulate through this budget, which in my judgment would, uh, that really slams the door of opportunity on millions of Americans. And as a result, I think that basic problem of what happens in disparity in income between rich and poor in this country would, would grow. I look at who would benefit from it. Uh, folks like you and I and people uh, in similar economic situations wouldn't be hurt much by this budget. The tax cut for uh, most of our friends would probably be pretty good who, if their income and asset level are uh, like uh, those of us uh, in this room. So, Mr. Chairman, I, as I said to our committee, I commended uh, Chairman Kasich and the majority for putting a budget together. Uh, I think it uh, is remarkable pol political skill. I think it represents the ideology of the majority. It's an ideology which I do not find myself in agreement with. However, this is the beginning of a long, long session. Uh, before the year is out, we have to find common agreement. I think the majority will be ultimately judged. It, so whether they have the capacity to go beyond the ideology of the moment and to practical reform. If you can have that capacity, you will have provided the impetus for some real reform in our fiscal system. However, if at the end of the year you end up still locked in ideology, not able then to go to practical reform to get something actually passed, then you may have done more damage uh, than you believed. Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to respond to your questions. <laughs> Mr. Sabo, uh, we, uh, we on this side of the aisle have always respected you and uh, your diligence uh, when you were the chairman of the, uh, of the Budget Committee, and uh, we continue to do so. A uh, couple of things come to mind. To my good friend uh, Tony Hall, who we also have great respect for, along with Mr. Bielenson, uh, uh, he was uh, bemoaning the fact that there was not a family-friendly budget before us as a as an alternative. And uh, again, I would point out that uh, that I did write uh, your predecessor, uh, Leon Panetta, a letter uh, asking him to uh, to give us uh, a budget that, that we could consider on the floor and. Uh, I guess I would just have to ask you the same question: uh, Why uh, the minority chose not to offer a um, a uh, budget uh, alternative? I recall a number of years ago when uh, when we Republicans changed the Reagan budget uh, to a point that it uh, did not resemble the uh, the budget that that President Reagan had presented to us, and I don't recall whether it was you or Bill Gray or Leon Panetta who offered the Reagan budget on the floor, and I might have been the only uh, vote that it received. I think it was somebody else, actually. Wasn't it Jack Kemp who voted for it? I think it was myself. Oh, okay. But uh, we'll, we, we can go back and check it anyway. But, uh, but Red, Red, why, rhetoric comes and goes, uh, Mr. Chairman. All right. Why, why, why uh, is there no minority uh, yeah, yeah, Democrat I, alternative? I, I, I can only speak for myself. Uh, I, I'm not sure that would serve any useful purpose at this point. I well, think uh, it would clearly be rejected out of hand. Clearly, the majority has their budget in mind. I expect you have the 218 votes lined up to pass it. Uh, I would hate to see some good ideas that may be useful later in the year casually rejected out of hand today, and they may be worth consideration come uh, September, October, November. 
Well, I just want uh, want you to know that uh, <coughs> the uh, the nine Republican members on this uh, in this rules committee are prepared to make in order a Gephardt substitute, uh, who is your your leader, your Democrat leader, um, if he chooses fit to to offer one uh, sometime between now and uh, the next 24 hours. Getting to the question of uh, hey, I would simply say, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's a long time between now and the end of this session. Yeah, I expect eventually for this session to be evolved. Something's mm -hmm. going to be have to. Past Congress. It's also signed by the president. I've heard. I heard. I've listened to lots of comments about the president today. I, I have listened to what he's been saying, and uh, uh, what I've been hearing the president saying is that uh, he is not willing to deal with significant cuts in health care to pass, uh, pay for a huge tax cut that's geared primarily to the affluent, not willing to cut uh, uh, cut education and training funds in this country. Uh, he has those criteria. If people are willing to accept those criteria, he's willing to sit and visit with them about the balance of how we put a budget mm -hmm. together. Is mm -hmm. what I've read consistently mm -hmm. in the in the uh, in the press and heard on on uh, on public media. And uh, I expect that at some point those negotiations will begin. Well, like the uh, the Washington Post editorial says, uh, it's too bad they didn't start, uh, you know, a month or two ago. Let, let me, let me to, make this additional you know. point, though, Mr. Chairman. And uh, in my judgment, the health care cuts, and they are cuts uh, from current law that you have in your budget, are too severe. <laughs> on the other hand, I, I think I and many understand that uh, those uh, programs need to be modified. The growth needs to be restrained, but in a in a positive fashion and not in a, a mean fashion. Let me suggest that the president two years ago or a year ago put a very comprehensive health care reform proposal before this Congress. I have never heard or seen a program so demagogued, both internally and externally, as the president's proposal on health care a year ago. Uh, I, would, I expect the rhetoric will be heated as uh, things go forward this year. I hope it never uh, it reaches the excesses of what I heard a year ago so that hopefully eventually we can find common solution. Well, I'll say to my good friend, I think it's already exceeded that uh, no, with, with, with so. the Medicare issue uh, today. No. Uh, let me get to the, to the time uh, allotted because it's your budget committee. Uh, the, uh, you mentioned uh, that we had had uh, two years ago 10 hours of debate uh, and uh, at that time uh, we had four alternatives before us, two Republican and two Democrat, one of which was uh, your, your committee uh, uh, substitute, and, uh, and we did allow 10 hours. However, last year, uh, when you were chairman, uh, at your request, we only had four hours of general debate, and um, uh, I don't know what we're going to arrive at uh, this time. Uh, uh, I think it will, will exceed more than four hours than you had last time. But absent the fact that uh, you don't have uh, a, an official leadership position, and, uh, uh, but the, the, the we will make in order at least two Democrat alternatives, um, I would imagine that somewhere around six hours uh, might suffice, uh, with one hour of that being, you know, the, uh, the Humphrey Hawkins uh, uh, debate, which, which could exceed uh, or, uh, you know, take up to one hour, which we normally do have in recent years. But as I look back over the amount of time that's been allowed since 1989, we've allowed five hours, six hours, five hours, three hours, uh, ten hours two years ago, and then four hours last year under your uh, Democrat leadership. So I would imagine that somewhere in between there lies a reasonable medium that we could allow this time. Would Chairman, that seem reasonable? Mr. Chairman, if I might, I, I would think uh, this would be more comparable to 93 than 94. In 94, we did not have any extensive, we had no reconciliation instructions. In 93, we, we did have extensive reconciliation instructions to the various committees. Uh, that was clearly a large and major uh, proposal. Uh, the budget this year is equally large, maybe larger in terms of its scope of impact. So I, I would think that the comparison uh, most accurate is between this year and 93. Well, certainly it would be if, uh, if there's going to be a uh, reasonable uh, Democrat uh, alternative. And uh, if that happens, then uh, we would certainly consider uh, additional time. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I might, I think that if I recall correctly, in 93, in addition to the 10 hours of general debate, there was additional time allotted to the individual amendments. 
Oh yes, and there would be this time. We would intend, I would imagine, if we, if we make uh, alternatives in order as substitutes, um, generally we've given one hour on each of those. I would even recommend uh, longer than that, perhaps an hour and a half on each of them. And we'll certainly take that into consideration. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, the issue, I guess, uh, is a very severe philosophical difference. Uh, I, I guess your testimony about what's, what's the use of, of submitting a budget uh, somehow falls short of what my expectation would be from the administration on this uh, and from the minority party. I think that that's the essence of deliberative democracy is to, is to discuss the differences. Uh, and I really am truly sorry that you know, there hasn't been some, uh, some kind of a, a different entry uh, into this debate. But let's go back to a couple of other areas of disagreement. Uh, and we served together on the Kerry Commission. And, and your words that there's not a crisis is probably true. If you went out on the street in America today, just asked anybody and said, is there a, is there a crisis, they'd probably say no. But if you start explaining them the facts and the kinds of things we heard in the Kerry Commission and uh, the kind of information that we were subjected to, uh, confronted with, there is a crisis. Uh, there's a crisis in Medicare Part A, which is upon us for sure. That may lead to a problem in Part B. Certainly there are crises in some areas with Medicaid. Some states I know and love and live in occasionally uh, run out of money before the end of the year. Um, and, and we have found that there are crises in uh, spots across our country. Uh, one comes to mind, our nation's capital seems to be undergoing a crisis right now. Uh, has to do a lot with ec economics. So I, I think it, it is possible to say that there's not a crisis and probably uh, get sort of a nodding approval across the country, but I don't think that's really what the situation is. I think that there are some extremely strong challenges that are going to be severe crises if we don't uh, address them fairly quickly. And I think that's what we're trying to do. But I don't want to mischaracterize that we are going into this in a crisis atmosphere. Uh, we are going into it because our management requires that we rectify what we see as a serious problem of continuously spending more than we have. Ms. Scott, uh, I would not disagree with you. I think there are problems. I think clearly as President Ankhead two years ago, the controlling cost of health care is absolutely crucial. And I find it crucial whether it's for the sake of the fund or reducing the deficit. Agree. Somehow that's got somehow drawing distinctions in public, I, I don't think that is of great relevance. But let me indicate a couple of concerns as it relates to Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, the projected caseload is close to 4% there. Uh, as I understand the budget proposal, it would be cap growth at around 4%, which would seem to indicate that uh, Medicaid growth would uh, really re reflect simply increased caseload and no additional costs. There you're dealing with some of the most vulnerable people in our society. The bulk of the costs in Medicaid, the greatest number of recipients are children, but the bulk of the costs are for very poor elderly and for the disabled. A significant portion of that being long-term care. I, I think uh, for it to get to that kind of growth rate is unrealistic. And the same in Medicare. I, again, uh, my own judgment uh, would be if uh, if this were a unicameral, unicameral body and one were to assume that this budget resolution was the final word and reconciled, I think, uh, frankly, not as a critic but as an observer, I think you'd fail. Simply because of the nature of the way you put your budget resolution together, they have Medicare considered separately from other proposals uh, in September. I frankly don't think a, a proposal that would cut Medicare to the degree that's suggested in this uh, budget resolution could pass this Congress because it's too severe. If that were to happen, several other parts of your budget would become unraveled and you'd be substantially out of balance. Uh, the chairman talked about average Medicare costs over a number of years. Uh, he is right that uh, growth in caseload is one, one and a half percent, I think closer to one percent. Projected increased costs are down to below four percent in one year. Uh, that is really pushing it. In, you're dealing with some of the most uh, vulnerable people in our society with the greatest uh, uh, great, greatest health care problems. 
uh, clearly, we have to get more efficiency out of that system to expect that we're going to get to that, that kind of rate of growth. I frankly think is unrealistic, and I think the only way you get there is by having some real impact on quality of service. Well, I uh, think that that really is the essence of the debate. Uh, we believe that instead of throwing our hands up and saying we're going to go over the cliff in seven years uh, into bankruptcy, that we think with some management changes we can do the job now. And you're right, there's risk in it. No question about it, there's some risk in it. But I'd point out that if you don't attack the cost drivers of Medicare right now, you don't solve the problem. And you've got to go after those cost drivers, and they're there. And we can do the growth of Medicare, which is 33 percent or however you want to measure it. We are providing for growth uh, in Medicare uh, over the years, in the next seven years. Uh, at the same time, we're trying to get rid of the, the useless waste of money that is existing in the program and change the way we do some of our business in terms of defensive medicine, administration, uh, insurance reform. This is not just a question of putting numbers on a piece of paper. This is a, also an issue of changing program. In Medicaid, you spoke uh, of the problem with Medicaid, uh, how tough it will be for the states. Sure it will, but look what's happened to Medicaid. We changed the law a couple of years ago and increased the consumer base of, Medicare, of Medicaid dramatically. And now uh, we have all kinds of people who really are not in quite as an acute need of Medicaid draining off Medicaid benefits because of some inartful language that we put in and some unintended negative consequences, particularly with regard to alcohol abusers, substance abusers, people who are having a bad hair day or suddenly diagnosed as having a mental health problem. These kinds of things are eating dollars. We've got states that have been creative about waivers that have been bleeding funds off for building infrastructure instead of putting it right there on the front line for the people who are truly needy. Those are program fixes. And I believe if we make the program fixes, which are out there and obvious, we easily, not easily, we will make the numbers we, we need to make. I don't think it'll be easy, but I think it, it can be done. I don't think it's impossible. Yeah, I don't quarrel that some of those issues have to be dealt with. I think the program expansion was mostly poor, poor kids. Uh, clearly, some states manipulated Medicare uh, uh, more substantially than others uh, to get in windfalls. And I, I frankly hope that you deal with that, that you simply don't award the, reward those states through some grandfathering language in your distribution formula. I, I think we're together on that one. And uh, let me say, as it relates to the basic question, again, I would suggest the President uh, made a very compelling case two years ago for the need to control totality of health care costs. Uh, unfortunately, we did not succeed in Congress in dealing with the that basic problem. But the President clearly took the leadership two years ago in a very substantial fashion. I, and again, uh, I, would, uh, I would indicate what I said earlier. I thought he ran into some of the most uh, uh, distorted demagoguery, both internally in the Congress and externally, by folks uh, who didn't want to see change as he put that proposal before us. Well, Mr. I hope we have a better result before this year is over of finding some common understanding and some agreement that's reasonable. I, I believe we will. Mr. Chairman, I've used most of my time. I, I did want to make one final quick comment, and that was that you also made a, a distinction, Mr. Sable, about the, the, the growing disparity between the rich and the poor. Uh, I would suggest that those numbers are very inconclusive, partially because we've redefined rich. Uh, we keep redefining what rich is. Uh, I mean, a lot of folks in my district who are senior citizens are astonished to find that if they're single family that they're rich if they're earning 35000 if they have $35,000 worth of income, or if they're double couple, 44000 That's very nice income to have, but that doesn't make them the affluent of America. And some of these folks are having a hard time getting by, and yet they're taxed as if they're, quote, rich. And for us to provide a little relief for some of those folks in our, in our tax relief program, which we've done in the contract with America, appears to me to be very fair as long as uh, we are using the tax dollars that we get from them wisely. And I believe we are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, let me just <coughs> say to the, uh, the former chairman, he talks about all the demagoguery and the rhetoric concerning the president's health care program. Uh, I, for one, uh, sort of resent that because, you know, the American people are not dumb people. Uh, they are extremely smart, and they can cut through all of the demagoguery if it's there, all of the rhetoric. They know what's best for them. And if there was anything that was rejected by the American people, it was President Clinton's health care proposals that says the government knows best and they can run your health program. The American people are the ones that rejected it, not this body. 
And I yield Chairman, I would simply please. say that was not a fair summary of the President's <laughs> program. Well, I think the election in November was the uh, fair summary of it. Mr. Bielanson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In response to our friend Mr. Goss, you know, some people perhaps are thought by others to be rich or wealthy if they have what we believe to be relatively modest amounts, although perhaps decent amounts of, of wealth. But what Mr. Sabo was speaking about and what the, and what the, um, uh, the statistics now show is that, for example, the, the highest 1%, the wealthiest 1% of people in this country have income equivalent to that of the lowest 40% total. 20 years ago, they had half the income of the lowest 40%. So there is a, an increase. We're talking about really wealthy people. We're not talking about your folks on 35 or 40. But gentlemen, yield on that point. Of course. It, it, it appears to me, Tony, that the, the issue uh, of those statistics really doesn't matter much as long as there is sufficient quality of life for the people at the lower end of the scale. Well, so that's the problem, they may of course. Be relatively poor, but they are still able to get along and have a good life. If okay. Ross Perot's got $4 billion or whatever he's got, that tilts the statistics, obviously. That makes him much richer than I am, but I don't feel poor. It's the, there's no need for us to argue. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, I just think that the statistics... The problem, as the gentleman understands, is for the average American making a modest amount of money, things don't seem so good to him or her as they did some time ago. And over... The gentleman from yeah, Minnesota yeah, I pointed out 20, 30 and 40 and 50 years ago, after the, immediately after the war, I mean, it's been kind of stagnant for most of these people. Anyway, I just want to say a couple of brief things, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I think we're lucky. I think the American people are lucky to have two such honorable and capable gentlemen as uh, Mr. Kasich for the majority and Mr. Sabo for the minority on this, uh, who's a senior Democrat uh, on the Budget Committee, uh, involved on our behalf and on their behalf with respect to making these decisions with respect to the budget. Makes, it gives all of us who know them personally, that is all of us here in the Congress, a great deal more confidence that what we'll finally come out with will make sense and will be reasonable and will be decent than if we didn't have two such uh, capable people. I do hope, that, uh, I do want to, I want to reiterate what Mr. Sabo said several minutes ago that I do hope that we can, that we can drop some of the ideology later on. Hopefully it'll, it'll be forced to be dropped, that we can work together and that by the end of this process later in this year that we will come up with something that makes some sense because all of us are anxious to get to a balanced budget in seven years and there are decent ways of doing it. There are, I think, more equitable ways of doing it that are, that are uh, encapsulated or incorporated in this particular proposal, and I hope that the pressures of politics from all sides um, will, will force the issue to, to be dealt with in a, in a better manner by the, end, by the time this, this, the year is up than, uh, than, than what we see before us uh, uh, now. And finally, I want to say, just a little political point, if I may make it. I don't, I don't mean to be needling out of our, of our friends, but I think it's fair to, fair to make note of the fact that if, if the, the President and the Democrats two years ago had not voted to reduce the size of the deficit a good deal lower than what they otherwise might have been over the, this year, next year, and next couple of years, uh, the job that our Republican friends, and all of us for that matter, have today to get the budget down to a balance in seven years, whatever it might be, would be a good deal more difficult uh, than in fact it is. And it would be even easier if they dropped this foolish tax cut, but that's another matter. Mr. So, Chairman, I, I, have, <laughs> I had a 1 o'clock meeting that I changed to 1.30, and if there are some quick well, questions, I... Quick question. Well, just a minute. Uh, yeah. We have to go in order here. Uh, Judge Price first, and then we'll try to... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief, Mr. Sabo. And, and I, I would just like to comment that uh, one thing that I have perceived to be true in this is that uh, timing is everything. And from my perspective in Columbus, Ohio, and I think from around the country, Oh, we see that people are really ready for a balanced budget. Uh, the mood is swung to that uh, place. And I think if we miss this opportunity, uh, it may be gone forever. And so I, I find it absolutely incredible that during this historic time that we find ourselves right in the middle of, that, that um, uh, the minority through its leadership or even through the Committee of Jurisdiction has not uh, come up with a proposal to balance the budget. And, and I mean, I just really want to know, don't you want to crack at this? I mean, don't you want to put your stamp on something that can save Medicare before it goes bankrupt? Don't you want to advise at least your leadership to help Mr. Gebhardt uh, to come to the Rules Committee with a proposal that we can uh, make in order so that um, y you will have been a part of this? Uh, Mr. Chairman. I, Mr. Uh, Chairman. If the, the majority were willing to relinquish its role, I'd jump at the opportunity. I would love to be in the majority again. <laughs> you set the goal, and I'd love well, the challenge of trying to meet it. 
th th that is not where we are today. We, we dealt in a very comprehensive uh, bu uh, fashion with budget over the last two years. Uh, there is a new majority. Uh, we look forward to, uh, we have now divided government. We look forward to working with them before the year is over to find uh, some common agreement. Well, in regard to that, if uh, I know the gentleman has to leave, but um, I'll just make the, the final suggestion again, uh, that uh, Mr. Gephardt, your Democrat leader, is welcome to develop his budget, uh, bring it before this committee, and uh, at any time in the next 24 hours, we can't stretch it any further than that, because general debate will begin uh, tomorrow uh, at a reasonable hour, and that will take most of the day. And I would just urge the gentleman to do sure. that. If I might, Mr. Chairman, might I ask uh, the chair a couple of questions? Sure. And I'm you just sure curious might. about what the process uh, is being planned because uh, this is a unique process uh, this year because several parts of what would be normally part of the budget process that's preceded the budget process, namely welfare reform and the tax bill, uh, they are reconciled within uh, the budget resolution. I'm just curious whether the assumption is that they will, whether they will be incorporated again within the reconciliation bill, or will the, will the reconciliation bill eventually proceed uh, without those parts of it? Well, the gentleman knows he's an expert on this, uh, this very, very complex budget process that needs to be uh, overhauled, and um, see some of the gentlemen in the background there who are very interested in overhauling it with, uh, with us on our side of the aisle as well. Uh, but the reconciliation process will have to follow. Uh, as you know, the budget is not binding. Uh, they are simple, simply budget caps. We can have all the assumptions we want, but everything is subject to change during the, uh, the legislative process of the 13 appropriation bills well, and any reconciliation bill that will come down behind it. But, but what I'm curious about is whether it's planned, and I was sort of asked Chairman Kasich this, but hmm. we were covering lots of things. Uh, as I understand this bill, it has reconciliation requirement the committee's report by mid-July. Yes. I am just curious whether the assumption is whether the appropriate committees will again report uh, uh, the tax bill and the welfare reform right. bill to incorporate them into the reconciliation process as so it goes, I assume, to the Senate for eventual conference, or will they continue to move separately from the reconciliation process? Well, I would say that you certainly that's up to your committee, and uh, I would suggest that you discuss it with uh, Congressman Kasich, and I'd be interested in sitting in on the meeting with you. Okay. So you, you don't know the answer? No. Okay. We thank the gentleman for coming. Thank you. If the gentleman has time, uh, we'd recognize Mr. Frost. Mr. Sabo, the Republican leadership uh, seems to be very nervous and apprehensive about making the Stenholm-Orton uh, coalition budget in order. Um, I intend to offer that in this committee. Uh, do you have any objection to the uh, Stenholm Orton budget, budget being offered, the conservative Democratic budget being offered on the floor of the House of Representatives? No, none whatsoever. I indicated earlier I, I urge the chair to, to uh, provide for that amendment and also the Black Caucus amendment in the rule. Well, I, I would hope that the, uh, that the chair and the other members of the committee will see fit to do that. They keep complaining loud and long that there is no Democratic budget being offered. There are a group of Democrats sitting right behind you that are prepared to offer a very responsible budget, and uh, I think it would be a travesty if they were to be denied that opportunity. I would agree with the gentleman. Uh, Mrs. Waldholz. Just to follow up on that, Mr. Sabo, uh, I understand you want it to be offered on the floor. Are you prepared to support the Orton Stenholm budget and vote for it, or do you simply think it ought to be discussed? Oh, yeah, both. Uh, my inclination right now, I haven't seen it in detail. I may well vote for both the Orton Stenholm uh, amendment and the Black Caucus amendment. But but you haven't taken a position yet on but the Orton amendment. But that's my inclination. Thank you. Did I, I hear the gentleman say that he, that he very would vote? Very useful to offer. Did I hear you say you would vote for the the Black Caucus and the Stenholm Orton? Yeah. <laughs> That's my current inclination. That covers all sides, I'll say that. We thank the gentleman for coming before us. Mr. Chairman, any Democratic budget is better. <laughs> the gentleman is excused. What, what is happening out there? On the Bollard Amendment, let's get down there and defeat it. <laughs> This meeting stands in recess until after the uh, two minutes after this vote uh, concludes.
Come on, we need your help, guys. <laughs> you gotta tie me into my chair. And we're gonna keep him up here. More from the House Rules Committee session on the 96th budget resolution debate in just a moment. First, some program information.